What's up, everybody? Before we start the show today, we have something really cool to announce coming up. Yeah, quick backstory. As most of you know, we were at every MagicCon this year, but we also created a bunch of exclusive Game Nights and Command Zone merch for those events. Yeah, it's really cool stuff, too. We're talking Game Nights themed pins, metal tokens, all new deck boxes. Yeah, my favorite is the playmat. We worked with Dominic Mayer, who is like my top magic artist right now. He created not one, but two incredible pieces of artwork. We call them the Nemesis playmats. There's a light and dark version, and together they form this single sort of fresco style image. Ooh, fresco. Yeah. Like the Sistine Chapel. <laughs> that, that's right. You heard it from Jimmy Wong, folks. These are the Sistine Chapel of playmats. Anyway, this is stuff you could only get in person at a MagicCon. Until now. That's right, until now, because we have some inventory left over and we wanted people who maybe couldn't make it to a live event this year to have a chance to get it. So we're teaming up with Whatnot for a live stream event on December 20th, starting at 4 p.m. Pacific. So come hang out with us. Just go to whatnot.com slash invite slash command. Basically, it's gonna be like a live episode of the podcast with the added bonus that you can pick up exclusive merch, ask us questions in chat, and get in on some cool giveaways. Oh, that's right. We are gonna be giving away stuff the entire time. Plus, if you sign up with our link, you're gonna get 15 bucks you can spend anywhere on the site for free. Yeah, that's $15 of free value. <laughs> so go to whatnot.com slash invite slash command, then bookmark our stream for December 20th at 4 p.m. Pacific. We can't wait to see you there. Peace. Peace. <laughs> <laughs> Greetings, humans. You have entered the Command Zone, your destination for all aspects of Elder Dragon Highlander. Enjoy your stay. Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of the Command Zone podcast. I'm your host, Rachel Weeks, and I am joined by two of your very favorite deck upgraders. It's Damon Lenz and Josh Murphy. Hello. Hey. We're your favorite deck upgraders. Yeah. That's, you guys upgraded the most decks this year. Wait, really? Yeah. Yeah, we what did. <laughs> Why you yeah. asked us to do this? Because yeah. we, we are the <laughs> most know. qualified. Rachel just walked in and was like, can you do this? I'm like, yeah, sure. Yeah. <laughs> I'll well, do podcast. No, yeah, you guys fun. upgraded the most precons through, throughout the year. Yeah. So uh, you are are clearly the most knowledgeable because yeah. today we're going through every single precon that was released in 2023. We're going to look back and see what the trends were in precons uh, and we're going to rank every single one of them individually. Uh, so from Lord of the Rings to Doctor Who, there were 25 precons came out this year. We're going to talk about every single one of them. But before we get into it, if you want to pick up any of the cards that we talk about today while supporting the show, you can do so at cardkingdom.com slash command. Card Kingdom is a great place to pick up singles or sealed product. If you bought any of these decks, if you're like, oh man, I forgot about that face commander and you want to go back and pick up any of these cards, go to Card Kingdom because when you do, you're supporting the show for absolutely free. Plus, you're getting the professionalism that Card Kingdom offers. Anytime you buy a card from there, you know it's going to be professionally packaged, professionally shipped, and get to you with no surprises. Nothing frustrates me more than when I buy a card and it shows up in a different condition than when I bought it. And I trust Card Kingdom because I know that they're going to package it in a way that it's going to end up on my doorstep in good shape. So again, go to cardkingdom.com slash command. And another way to support the show is if you use Ultra Pro products, you can go to ultrapro.com slash command. That's the websites to go to if you just want to get stuff from Ultra Pro directly, or you can use uh, Ultra Pro products at your local game store. They'll probably have some because they're cool and awesome. They got dice, sleeves, play mats, all sorts of awesome gaming accessories that you could ever want or need. They're great gift ideas for the holidays coming up soon. So yeah, ultrapro.com slash command is the best place to go. They got sick art, sick products that you and your friends will love for sure keep your cards safe keep them organized keep them looking good yeah, yeah and the final way to support us is directly at patreon.com slash command zone all of our patrons get super cool perks you get access to our discord where we talk about magic all the new projects products all the new cards new episodes as they come out you can be in our discord talking about it plus you get access to exclusive content like turn talk which is just a discussion we have after every single episode of extra turns you can see us and our guests talk about the game we just had what we wish we had drawn what we guy if you hadn't done this i could have done that and ah one more card and uh, you know it's really fun just to hear people talk about commander really passionately yeah. and in a way that feels really raw um so so join our Patreon, support the show, and get access to some cool content. 
early and without ads, which is pretty sick. And there's one more thing that patrons get, right, Rachel? Yeah, they get shouted out. Yeah. And every single <laughs> podcast episode, and this podcast episode is dedicated to... to- Rebecca, Rebecca Crane. Crane! You rock. That wasn't very Rebecca well Crane. synchronized. Right, yeah, what should we? One, two, th- one, two, three. Rebecca, Rebecca Crane. Crane! You get two shout outs because of how much you rock. Absolutely. <laughs> At the end it. of the year, this is a big episode. Yeah, it is a very big episode, yeah. We are talking about every single pre-con in 2023. And I wanted to give a little bit of context before we get into each individual pre-con because there were a lot that came out this year. Mucho, right? you might say. 25 individual decks were released for commander players Quarter. remember year. when it was like four yeah like yeah. maybe four, five eight, five a year <laughs> yeah uh just an astronomical amount and um in in general they were pretty sweet i wanted to the most popular color grouping was jeskai there were four jeskai precons almost wow. almost a fifth yeah, of the decks that came out this year were jeskai which is white, blue, and red, of course. Followed by Abzan, there were three decks, and Grixis, there were three. So Abzan, white, black, green, Grixis, blue, red, black. A lot of bad guy decks this year. Yeah. A lot of, uh, a lot, a good mix there, though, which I, mm-hmm. I kind of like. You know, you have uh, blue represented twice, black represented twice, white represented twice. Mm-hmm. The only one that really is underrepresented, I guess, is green. Green? Or is it, yeah, it was just in, just in Absan. But we've had a lot of green throughout the years. So yeah. it was nice to see. I think specifically Just Guy and Absan felt very underserved in the mm-hmm. in the commander, like legendary creature slot. Yeah, there, sure. there hasn't been a ton because I, mm. I think, if memory serves me correctly, there's like Carador, and then there was, uh, what was the one from Commander 20? That had uh, the ability counters. Anna Fenza? No, ability no. counters. You're yeah. talking about Cathril. 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 That's the, the bug. one. There, yeah. There's that maybe one more that we've seen in the entire yeah, of a, Commander Yeah, there's the leader from cons. Mm. Was yeah. also Abzan, yeah. Anna, Anna Fenza. You're talking about yeah. pre-cons, though. Pre-cons. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure, yeah. sure, sure. Yeah, so three Ab- Abzan pre-cons was a big deal. Um, we're going to talk, we're going to break down some stats for each of these. Just do a big, cur- like a cursory stats breakdown for the year. So I wanted to give you some average uh numbers so you have a little bit of context when we start talking about these uh this year we did a bang for your buck value for every precon that's for every american dollar spent you get this many dollars in reprint value uh and the average bang for your buck across all 25 of the decks was two dollars and 60 cents so for every one dollar you spend, you get two dollars and sixty cents of cards back. That's the average. Just so you know that, like when we see them later, it's either lower or higher than average. Yep, sure. The average price per reprinted card of twenty twenty three was two dollars and seven cents. So this is like if you pulled a random reprint from twenty twenty three, it averaged to be two dollars and seven cents. I see. So that'll tell you like the quality of reprint. Generally. We're going, to, we're going to talk about these decks from a personal perspective, but we had some specific criteria that we wanted to look at for each deck. Um, I think starting with playability. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. I think that was a big priority, at least for me. And I think mm-hmm. everybody that we were like, we want to be able to reasonably be like, hey, pick this deck up. You're going to have fun playing it. It's mm-hmm. good out of the box. Yeah, I think that's at least for me, priority number one, yeah. uh, because... There's plenty of decks that come out and they can have good reprint value, bad reprint value. But at the end of the day, if the deck's not fun to play, if it doesn't work as a product in and of itself, Mm -hmm. uh, it's just not that good of a product. So second of all, of course, reprint value has something to do with this grade that we're giving it overall. So this is like, if you spend this much money, how much actual value do you get out of it? And like, this is just because we want, when you buy a commander deck, you want real cards in it. You want playable cards that are good in this deck, but also good if you break the deck apart and Mm -hmm. you need the cards for other decks, especially in the mana base category. Yeah, I want to know that not only when I pick up a deck, it's going to be great out of the box, but that if I need to take it apart for parts, Mm -hmm. that I have those pieces for a good series of other decks, not just niche to one strategy. Yeah. Uh, The next category was new card impact. So most pre-cons have 10 brand new cards in them that we've never seen before or in no other products. There are other, there are certain pre-cons that came out this year that have more than 10 yeah. brand new cards. But these are cards that like have affected the format where they got released in this deck and they come out and we see them more often. Yeah, it does have cool new cards. Yeah. We like cool new cards, always we're Usable, magic players. Usable, powerful, yeah. like <laughs> cool new card. And then finally, the cool factor. Yeah. 
there's something we had we struggled a lot to be like what is this yeah what we is said this? it's the uh, je ne sais quoi, je ne sais quoi. Yeah. <laughs> it's, uh... like when you see the pregon is it something you've never seen before is yeah. it does it feel special and intriguing um yeah like for me personally yeah a uh, plus one plus one counters deck that's like just adds more plus one plus one counters onto things and doesn't do anything unique or cool with mm-hmm. it. That is very bottom of the barrel as far as rule of cool. Yeah. But if it's something that I've literally never seen before in the game of Magic the Gathering, that's really high on the rule of cool scale. That is so, true. Yeah. That's what we're looking for. Something that is nice, neat, cool, new that we've never really seen before. Unique. Yeah. All right, we're going to hold these precons to a very high standard. All of us have assigned ratings to each of these precons so you can get our individual tastes, but we're going to give you an overall command zone stamp <laughs> of, of grade as well. Wait, yeah. you're not just going to use mine? No, no, sorry. Oh, right. Come on, Rachel. Actually, we, over, we, we re- <laughs> overrode you on a number of things. Yeah, quite a few Dang. of them, actually. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's get into it. We are going to go through these decks chronologically, starting with the first set of the year which was all will be one. Yeah, the first one up is the Corrupting Influence deck. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is the green, white, black uh, toxic deck mm-hmm. with uh, Excel Sign of Atraxa as the commander. Yeah, let's read Excel real yeah. quick for a little bit of a memory refresh. So many new cards have come out. So like, yeah. I can't keep Since these all straight. Then, and I doubt. Yeah, and they all have like this that. much text on them too. Yeah. So it's like, <laughs> yeah. So this is one white, black, green for a 2-5 Phyrexian Angel with Flying Vigilance and Toxic 2. It has corrupted at the beginning of your end step. Each opponent who has three or more poison counters exiles the top card of their library face down. You may look at it and play those cards for as long as they remain exiled and you may spend mana as though it were mana of any color to cast those spells. Uh, so Ixhel was toxic, but specifically corrupted, which was a mechanic of all B1. It wants three or more. Yeah. yeah th- it cared about yep. it. It was a little less aggressive than we've seen most like infecty decks sure. play and a little bit more value based, which is sort of interesting. Uh, before we get into discussion, the bang for your buck for this one was two dollars and forty cents of reprint value, so a little lower than average. And the average price per reprint was one dollar and seventy one cents. Also so a little lower. Also, yeah. pretty significantly, uh, like thirty seven cent, thirty six cents lower yeah, than average. Two seven is the average for that one. Yeah. Yeah. Hate to so. See it. Pretty low quality of reprint overall. Yeah. And the most impactful reprint from this one mm-hmm. was Grafted Exoskeleton. It was. At time of printing, Grafted Exoskeleton was $9.50. Yeah. Which, Which is not the most impactful reprint we've ever seen. Again, it's yeah. always good to see. Yeah. It's nice to have but. this card be... It was nice to have this card be cheaper because yeah. it's, it's not like super, super broken. So... We were happy to see it, but it wasn't. It, it wasn't the quality of reprint that we saw throughout. Yeah, we would have liked more. Yeah, for sure. Meanwhile, the uh, most played new card was Glistening Sphere. It was. This one's pretty spicy. It's a three mana artifact. It enters the battlefield tapped. When it enters the battlefield, proliferate. It taps to add one mana of any color, and it also has corrupted. Tap add three mana of any one color. Activate only if an opponent has three or more poison counters. I had to look this one back up because I was like, Glistening Sphere. I don't remember that card. What's that? Yeah. And then we, we were reading it here and we're like, oh, it's a three mana rock. And that's the most played. And that comes in tapped. That comes in tapped. Yes. Okay. But, <laughs> yeah. but if you have the corrupted thing, it's a three mana rock that as soon as you untap gives you that three mana back. Right. Which is pretty nice. And because of the proliferate, you just needed two counters on something. Mm-hmm. It gives you the third. So yeah. like. Yeah. What I remember from of the new cards from this deck and from from this deck specifically, I guess, mm-hmm. is a lot of the new cards were super, super narrow yeah. because mm-hmm. they were yeah. focused on uh, poison counter strategies overall, which is a very small corner of the commander population. Yep. Uh, a lot of them just didn't get into the bloodstream at all. Yeah, where something like this that has proliferate on it, and that can be a myriad of mm-hmm. things. Yeah. And yeah. you could, in your proliferate deck, also have just a couple of things that give poison here or there mm-hmm. to get to that corrupted. So uh, I understand why it's more used in more decks than a lot of the cards from this set mm-hmm. but that's true proliferate does cast a much wider net and yeah. we did get we'll get to it later but we did get a planeswalker la- uh, deck later in the year so maybe people were figuring out how to s- slot that in yeah uh, i could see it but you know it's it still is a little narrow yep not my favorite new cards of the year but let before let, let's talk about everybody's rank and then yeah. uh give a little bit of reasoning behind your ranking 
Sure. So I'll go first. So I gave this deck a B. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that, yeah, the reason for that is I really liked how they were giving Infect a new way of playing Commander that wasn't just, I'm going to play a little 1-1 and pump it as much as possible and try to kill somebody quickly. Mm -hmm. This one was like, I'm just going to spread out a little bit of Infect and then just outgrind my opponents, which is something Infect's never done before. Mm -hmm. It was also very unique for Abzan because we we really didn't have that. Mm -hmm. Um, And so... For me, that felt very cool, very unique and fresh, and I hadn't seen anything like it, which made me uh, like this deck a lot more, and it was fun out of the box. Yeah. So. Yeah. Uh, I ranked it a D uh, because, I don't know, Damon does make a good point in that it's something different. Uh, It was trying something new with the poison slash toxic mechanic of, hey, let's try to spread things around. The problem with that is it wasn't very good. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And still isn't very good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because inherently with poison counters, you want to get people to 10 as fast as possible and spreading it around slows that down by quite a bit. So I totally understand why they did what they did. And I think it was quite worthwhile of them to try it. But the end product, as I get it as a consumer, I think is worth a D. Doesn't have great reprints. Doesn't have great new cards. Overall is a little bit clunky to play, at least mm-hmm. from my experience. Um, when I, I've played against this deck a few times in a pod, deck never really won uh, against other pre-con type of decks. And I don't know, yeah. just not my favorite. I gave this one a D as well. I, yeah. it, again, it was pretty low on the reprint value <laughs> side, and I didn't introduce a ton of cards that really impacted Commander in yeah. any way. I was sort of surprised to see uh, that Norn's Choir Master wasn't the most played card out of this deck. Yeah, that is just good. a straight proliferate card and is a lot less narrow. Yeah. Uh, this is just colorless, I suppose, and that means it goes more decks. Um, I agree with Murph, I think I, it's interesting that they're being creative and that they're taking a sort of contentious strategy and trying to make it more casual and make it more playable. But I think that fundamentally misunderstood commander players yep. in that, in fact, is scary. And when you can die out of nowhere, you're going to get killed. So you do not have time to dawdle and cast cards off the top of your opponent's library. Yeah. Um, I, I just didn't think that Excel was a good commander at all the backup commander the backup commander was very powerful but it was a combo commander that didn't kill with infect no yeah it's like an infinite combo (laughs) commander that just makes tokens when it enters you sack the tokens and blink it again it was like that's not exactly what we want it was like an aristocrats token like it a commander it just i i can't remember what it's called but it it was just both of them didn't do what they were supposed to do in my mind and i think that made it uh, a cool shot but a missed shot, in my opinion. Uh, so overall, command zone rank is a D because Murph and I were on D side, but it is a D plus because Damon liked it. That's true. <laughs> oh, that is that is one thing. We did decide elect to round down for all yes. of these. So if it was like, if it had any sort of grading on there, mm. we always round it down. Yeah. So uh, we're going to give them even, even grades so they fit cleanly on these lines. <laughs> <laughs> That's how tier lists work. That's how like melee tier lists have yeah. worked yeah, exactly. at the beginning yeah. of time. There's no plus. And no by plus that I mean like minuses. 2005 or something yeah, like that yeah, whenever exactly. they started, yeah. Next one uh, was also an all be one precon. This is Nayali Sun's Vanguard. Uh, this is Re- Rebellion Rising was the name of it. It was a rebel deck. It was red and white token themed. Uh, the bang for your buck was pretty high at two dollars and sixty six cents, or just above average. Yeah, uh, respectable. Bang for your buck, and its average price per reprint was quite low at one dollar and fifty seven cents. So the quality of the cards in this deck were fairly low, but what you got for your money was better, yeah, just okay. because there were certain high reprints. Yeah, it is interesting that uh, both of these decks are relatively low. Mm-hmm. So I guess I'll be one just. Yeah. Not, not a lot of value there. But on the low side. Yeah. Uh, let's introduce the face commander just so people remember. This is Nayali Sun's Vanguard. Two, a red and a white for a 3 3 human rebel. It says attacking tokens you control have double strike. Whenever one or more tokens you control attack a player, exile the top card of your library. During any turn you attacked with a token, you may play that card. Um, this is super powerful commander. The backup yeah. was Othari, which made rebel tokens. Uh, overall, the deck went with the Vermiridon yeah. mechanic, which is a little underwhelming and had like an equipment sub theme going on. But mm. in the upgrade, I believe we just trashed the equipment sub theme. Yeah, pretty, <laughs> <laughs> pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> You're just like, but what if yeah. we just did tokens? Because that's probably better. <laughs> what it cares about 
probably the most. Yeah. Uh, it did have a very valuable reprint in Flawless Maneuver, which was $25 at time of recording Great that reprint. episode. Yeah. Uh, so that card has come down significantly. It's been reprinted a lot throughout the year, but it was a an really strong reprint at the time. Yeah. Mm. And it also had a very powerful new card in Clever Concealment. I forgot Clever Concealment came from this deck. Yep. I've seen this card a lot, and uh, it always does work. <laughs> it's awesome. Clever Concealment's too white white for an instant with Convoke. Any number of target non-land permanents you control phase out. Yeah, this card's a house. Really, it's, it's excellent. Really good. Yeah. And uh, it makes this deck feel very worth it for me. Clever Concealment is a white card, and it's in 34,743 decks on EDH Rec. And that compared to the Corrupting Influence, the Glistening Sphere is only in 26,320 decks, and that's a colorless card. Yeah, yeah it's wild. Remember, these numbers are um, a little bit tough to measure, but we're just comparing them to each other today. Yeah. Um, so it does is seeing play in a ton of decks, and honestly, I think it should see more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, the card's excellent. Uh, it's often just a free uh, protection piece from mm. everything, from board wipes to bounce spells to target removal. It doesn't matter. It will protect you from everything, and it also, unlike Flawless Maneuver, hits your whole board as opposed to just the creatures. It's just, it's great every it's, time you play. It's it. selective. And it, yeah, yeah, because you can be like, I want to keep this. I want to get rid of this. I want to keep this, phase this out, mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. It's like they tried to make a more fair to fairies protection, but it's free. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it is free. But it doesn't it doesn't protect you, so I guess it like, you know, it evens out a little bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but to be fair, to fairies protections are most often played to try to save your board. And yeah, yeah. Like true, set up true, true. for a good right. yeah. crack to back. Not die. Uh, I thought it was interesting that flawless maneuver and clever concealment came in the same deck. Yeah, that's funny. Because clever concealment to me is significantly better than flawless maneuver. Yeah. Uh, and that was the reprint that we were very excited about. So yeah. I was like, wow, these are two free board protection <laughs> spells with a very powerful command. I kind of ran through all of the stats here, but Neali is an anthem effect for all of your tokens, yep. and it could draw up to three cards that you can cast on any turn that you attack with a token. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I do like that a lot. And and going to the, the maneuver and the concealment, I respect that they realized Boros is going to commit to the board. It mm -hmm. needs these protection pieces in order to really like have a fighting chance. Mm -hmm. So adding those to what is a very aggressive strategy that's going to commit a lot of resources to play, I think is great. Yep. So Damon, overall, what would you rank this? I ranked this deck as a B. Oh, sorry. I misread. I read it, ranked it as a C. Yeah. I went too high. <laughs> I gave this deck a C. I'm going to do that so I don't do that again. Yeah. I gave this a C and I'll tell you why. Yeah. Uh, this deck, perfectly serviceable out the box. We just said a lot of great things about it. I could give this to somebody and be like, you're going to have an okay time with this. Yeah. My issue with it is, and you sort of touched on it, sure, it's doing the tokens thing, which is really cool. It really leaned pretty heavily onto the equipment thing and we have a million Boros equipment decks. Sure. So it was just very boring. Like I looked at that and I was like, it's not that different from my Akiri deck. Mm. And so it just doesn't interest me very much. Um, and so for me, that jumped it a little bit lower than normal, mm -hmm. just because it, it was just something we've seen a million times. Yeah. So. And the backup commander isn't exactly, you know, blowing anybody's hair back, right? Yeah. Like, no. it's just whenever it attacks, you make more and more rebel. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> it, so I, I don't think Othari really made a big splash. And honestly, I think Nayali made less of a splash than I thought that she would. Yeah. For yeah. being like a powerful card advantage engine in a Boros deck. Yeah, she's good, but I, I yeah. legitimately have not seen her out in the wild yet. Really haven't. I no. put it in a couple, a couple of decks in the 99 but i mm. have never seen it in the command zone yeah. outside of somebody playing this this commander uh out of the box yeah and that's a good point like i i also haven't seen nayali out in the wild but i have seen the uh the excel out in the excel. wild i've yeah. seen excel I've seen decks multiple times i've multiple seen times. i've seen plenty of excel decks even just playing at random mm -hmm. is outside of my normal play group but i've never seen nayali and so for mm -hmm. me that's a pretty decent indicator of we're like telling it. Yeah. that like at least that one was trying something new and this one was it definitely has some new and cool things about it but is not really rocking the boat too much yeah uh, that being said, what a did you grade it, Murph? Uh, I also graded a C, uh, very similar to Damon's reasons. Um, I, I think the two cards that we've been talking about, Flawless Run Maneuver and Clever Concealment, like those are very good powerhouse. Like top of the top, this has some good cards in here, but it also has some not very car good cards in here. Overall reprints mm -hmm. were just not great. Um, like yeah, the average, was quite low. the average yeah. reprint value was pretty low. So, mm -hmm. uh, and it played, like you said, fine. Like I, I would give this exactly a passing grade. Like yeah. there's some bad things about it. There's some good things about it. So overall you passed. Yeah. <laughs> 
I gave this one a B, surprisingly. <laughs> I really liked this deck. I thought I thought Nayali offered a lot in the command zone, and I felt like it had that aggressive energy that I want in a Boros deck, mm. but it had enough of the interaction pieces and enough of the card advantage pieces that you're not struggling as much as Boros can uh, in aggro strategies. So yeah. I just thought it was a really well-built deck, not necessarily one that is super shocking or mm. is changing the game or anything like that, but if I was going to hand this to some Somebody and be like, this is how it plays. It feels like it is a deck that they could pilot immediately. It could o- they could upgrade over the years, and it would have a lot of pieces that like. Yeah, it's not about start. you are already. Yeah. It's a really strong starting point for a deck, which is what I really want out of a precon. Like when I buy it, mm-hmm. I want to be intrigued enough by one of the com- commanders, and I want to like grow with it. Yeah. yeah, that makes sense. And I think Nayali really offers that. Whereas Excel felt like one of those decks that like if you pick it up and you put pieces in it, you're like, ah, my playgroup killed me and I took it apart. Yep. Uh, like we haven't seen Excel in the last <laughs> six months. It's true. It's true. <laughs> All those decks that I saw were around the time of its release. Haven't seen it since. <laughs> yeah. That being said, this deck is a C uh, because what I say isn't enough. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but, it, it is very cool. I just don't yeah. think there's quite enough pieces for this to be. I agree. Yeah, super uh, great. For me, it's just too samey. Moving on to March of the Machine. March of the Machine had five commander precons, so many. Uh, and we're going to start with the call for backup precon. Uh, this is the green, white, red deck. It's Naya, <laughs> and it was themed around backup, which is a mechanic in March of the Machine, but generally it was a plus one, plus one counter deck. Yep. Uh, the commander was a Bright Palm Soul Awakener, one red, green, white for a legendary Fox Shaman. She's a 4-3 with backup one. Whenever this creature attacks, double the number of plus one, ca- plus one counters on target creature. That creature can't be blocked by creatures with power two or less this turn. So that's a lot of words to say that when this attacks, something gets bigger. Yep. And it's a little bit harder to block. And it is a little bit harder, harder just, to just block. A bit harder bit to much. chump. Harder to block. Worse than trample, better than nothing. Yes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, statistically, the bang for your buck value was at $2.24. Low. So low. Yeah. The average price per reprint was very low at $1.24. Currently Ooh. the worst. Extremely low <laughs> Currently the reprint worst. quality uh, in this deck. And it's interesting because the most valuable reprint in this deck was Colonian Hydra. I mean, it's a cool Hydra that just has re- not really been reprinted much, mm-hmm. if at all. Um, yep. at, and time, at time of printing, it was $19. But and people like Hydras. And people uh, like Hydras. People like Hydras. You know, and it's, who it might has, argue? <laughs> it has trample, and when it attacks, it gets bigger each time. Yeah. 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 The most played new card is actually pretty sweet. It's Uncivil Unrest. It's four and a red for an enchantment. Non-token creatures you control have Riot. Riot! So either haste or a counter. If a creature you control with a counter on it would deal damage to a permanent or a player, it deals double that damage instead. Another one that I had said be like, what does that card do again? Oh, that's actually really cool. It's pretty it, good. It yeah. does a lot of good things, but I don't think I've seen anybody play it. No. Five mana setup piece is really expensive. Yeah, because you really want the, for that riot ability, you want yeah. that to be a lot cheaper. Just like play stolen strategy type effects again. Yeah. <laughs> Five mana do nothing enchantments, please. So. Yeah, it's, it's tough this, because I looked at this card and was like, what a haste damage doubler yeah. that also puts counters on stuff. That's a slam dunk. And it just, it's kind of too expensive. And it was in an underwhelming deck um, that I think most people didn't look twice at. Naya counters didn't surprise anybody. Yeah. Uh, I think the only thing yeah. people looked at was the backup commander, which was Shalai and Halar. Um, yeah. That one was pretty good. Yeah. That one I liked a lot. It was very powerful. Yeah. No. The problem with this one was like, again, face commander, kind of confusing and boring. Backup commander, infinite combo. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that seems to be an ongoing theme. What Thank you. Not what we're looking <laughs> for. <laughs> Please. <laughs> Please. They were like, oh, it goes infinite with uh, four things. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> like, oh, man. Yeah, it sucks, too, because like the front face commander is what sells the box. And when you look at the box, you're like, this is boring this isn't interesting so <sighs> yeah that um, was that was tough uh all of that being said damon what's your ranking for this one i gave this a the uh d i gave it a d mm-hmm. d for damon um <laughs> just because like again counter is super boring and 
you know, it was trying to feed off the backup mechanic, which is new to March of the Machine, mm. which inherently makes a deck a lot less powerful because right. you don't have a bunch of cards from the past to pull from. It's like you get to put cards in here from March and from this and that's it. And sure, you can cast a wider net and go just counters in general. But when you're really trying to focus on that backup thing, because that's like the cool new thing, it just it's not very interesting. Yeah. So I just... This one just felt like a dud to me and like I wouldn't feel great about being like, hey, new person, pick up this deck and you're going to have a great time and have something mm-hmm. you can upgrade forever. So it's like D. backup is cool, but it is also a very complicated mechanic to play. Yeah, it is because <laughs> you're like, I put the counter and on just this turn, it has this ability. Yeah. And then I do the thing and then this retains the ability. And then later on, if I play another backup thing, I can pass that again. Mm. And it's like, it's just and Tricky. there's not enough of them. There's yep. not enough of them yet. So yeah, Murph. Uh, yeah, this might be slightly contentious, but I give this a flat out F. Mm. I think that this deck is just not at all good and not something, uh, the type of deck that Wizards should be making. Uh, like you said, the backup mechanic is quite complicated. So even though this is a relatively, uh, it has a lot of relatively simple cards in it. Yep. If I handed this to a new person and said, here you go, here's a good deck to learn with. That would actually not be a good deck to learn no. with. Absolutely yeah. not, because there's so many questions. It's very complicated, even also, to read. So much dice management. So much yeah. dice management. You have to take True. a look at the cards. The face commander, read it, read it again, mm. read it again. All right, now I got it. And that yeah. is not the type of card that you want to be handing to new players. So no. I think it fails on that front. Mm-hmm. And then again, it just does not do enough that's good or different or interesting to appeal to like more long-term, intermediate to advanced Magic players. Mm-hmm. Uh, and also, the average reprint value is atrocious. Is abysmal. <laughs> it's yeah, $1.24. It's, so <laughs> it's really So low. it doesn't do anything. It doesn't satisfy any camp. Uh, and so for that reason, I'm out. Yeah. By that, I mean it's an F. Even the most played new card on, was only in, it's in less than 10,000 decks on EDA track. And that's the most impactful new card. That's a from bummer, which this. is not very. Uh, you don't want that. It's not very impactful. Um, I also gave this one a D. I, I really liked the backup mechanic. I thought it was um, sort of a clever way to give attack triggers haste without being able to like introduce it. To, it encouraged you to have more creatures Mm -hmm. the problem is plus one plus encounters is such a deep strategy in commander already that these cards are not going to crack the top hundred cards to get into a plus one plus one counter deck just Mm -hmm. generally um any of these new cards just paled in comparison to what we already have and that made it look like just an underpowered plus one plus one counter deck uh just didn't offer enough um value or playability or anything to make it like rise to the top especially yeah. when it was released with five pre-cons yeah um so i i gave this one a d because i did think backup was interesting but i <laughs> that is the not enough of, for it at the end of the day me. that doesn't sorry really, Rachel. that doesn't really get it uh that means it is a d minus ish for the <laughs> minus, yeah zone. d pointing down <laughs> uh, uh super excited about this next one because i did this upgrade you did do this upgrade. yeah this is the cavalry charge deck it's the uh esper knights mm-hmm. uh ran by sadar jabbar of Zalfir. Of Zalfir. Uh, nice blue, white, black knights deck. The bang for your buck in, on this deck was $3 and one cent. Let's go! We can get over the average. We love above average. We choose <laughs> to have a high reprint value, not because it is easy, but because it is hot. <laughs> <laughs> a little disappointing that the average price per reprint of this deck was below average at $1.60, which usually means, again, it has a couple of really high ticket items, yeah. but the quality on average just wasn't was super middling. high there's a ton of knights in it yeah. and some of them were just not very expensive yeah, <laughs> yeah. it also brought back eminence eminence oh boy <laughs> we were very shocked that they brought that back. oh my god yeah. we could not believe it. i like, read it and my jaw fell open we're like wait we're doing this again i thought we learned this back in 2017 that yeah. eminence is like absurd <laughs> Eminence. So uh, this is a four mana human knight. It's a four three with flying and first strike and eminence. Whenever you attack with one or more knights, if Sadar Jabari is in the command zone or on the battlefield, draw a card, then discard a card. Whenever Sadar Jabari deals combat damage to a player, remember it as first strike, return target knight creature card from your graveyard to the battlefield. Very, very powerful. That's great. Um, yeah, I mean... 
This deck had, oh, the, the most valuable reprint in this deck was Vanquisher's Banner, which was at the time sitting at $20. I think yeah. it got that high up. Hadn't yeah. seen a reprint yeah. in a while. It's been reprinted a lot throughout the year, uh, which did bring that price down significantly. But at yeah. the time, we were like, you know, waving the flag. Yeah. Uh, just <laughs> <laughs> we were waving the banner. We were yep. excited. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> the most played new card is Chivalric Alliance, it, which is in 14,000 decks on EDH Rec. So like an, a reasonable number number of cards again this deck was very narrow it was a knight's deck mm-hmm. yeah but that card is sweet though the chivalric alliance mm-hmm. it's a great card draw engine and it gives white a way to pitch things yep which is a little bit more unique so i like uh, that card I've, I've ended up seeing and considering it for a lot of other decks outside of just knights yeah it's also only two mana which yeah. is nice it's a two mana enchantment whenever you attack with two or more creatures draw a card and then two discard a card make a knight token yeah super versatile very cheap it's exactly what i want in my more aggro decks it yep. gives me a way to make tokens and turn lands into Could cards be a discard outlet yeah. Yeah. Want, yeah uh instant speed creatures are always good and they have vigilance and they have vigilance so overall that when this deck came out we were all like what is this knight yeah. deck yeah <laughs> we like everybody was like well you gotta get the knight's deck <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's a little like if unless you're not interested in knights, then I guess not. Yeah, it was probably no, definitely the most powerful mm. deck of everything, and to me the most interesting. Yeah, because this is not really a color combination that we've really seen knights in. Blue, right, historically black, they're Mardu. White. Yeah, because uh, we got the Sir blue, Gwyn yeah. back in Throne of Eldraine that sort of gave them the equipment identity, and yeah. this was like do knights, but you don't need to do equipment. You can just reanimate things, and it's like this is sweet in Esper, something that Esper really hadn't done before. Mm-hmm. I really liked that they brought, they introduced a two Esper commanders that relied on combat. Yeah. Um, Esper tends to be a really controlling color trio, so it makes it very difficult to build casually. But Sidar was powerful and engaging yep. and gave people sort of a reason to build an Esper deck that wasn't just cast a bunch of board wipes. Yeah. Um, so I really did like this deck a lot, even though it is like pretty narrow overall like if you're not yeah. into knights then you're not into Sidar. <laughs> although i kind of looked at Sidar and was like what if you put a bunch of cheap knights and then just made it a reanimator deck yeah you totally could easily like yeah. if you include like 15 one drop knights and then just bombs to discard to it then it, it's, it's flexible enough i think yeah. that's it not that it can pull in multiple different directions but it has a little bit more underneath the surface mm-hmm. than you might initially think of and no, just jam knights in yeah. yeah notably it only pulls out knights so you can't just go completely yeah, crazy but, but three looters but, on your first turn <laughs> yeah exactly uh which i think ended up being like when you up, like fully upgraded it was the way to go you just play all these mm-hmm. uh, little one ones or two twos get them as soon as possible and then reanimate like the cavalries and mm-hmm. stuff like that um and then eventually we got the uh the Moonshaker Cavalry, yeah. which oh, like is that a knight? Yes, yep. that is a knight, and, and that it hit, didn't exist when this commander and came he out. Has, so I didn't even think he has first strike. Now. So he hits you, reanimate the Moonshaker Cavalry, it pumps your team, and now you just won. Uh oh! Oh my goodness! Yeah, yeah. it's <gasps> quite good. And uh, the fact that the loot is on attack, a lot of time when I play the deck, it's like I'm keeping something crazy in my hand, so mm-hmm. my opponents are like, "Oh, they, you don't have anything, whatever." You yeah. go to swing, and then you're like, "Pitch this! I'm gonna hit you!" And now it's back, and it's like, "Oh, wow." Yeah. Meanwhile, so. your commander is a 4-3 first strike flying. Yeah. Yeah. It's like Nuts. a bus. They gave it flying <laughs> and then first strike. It's so hard to block. Yeah, it, it can get so through most things. Yeah. Yeah, uh, let's let's move to greats, Damon. I gave it an A. Uh, This deck is fantastic. Mm -hmm. The only reason it's not an S is out of the box, it didn't leverage the eminence ability very well, uh, which is something that I focused on in the pre-con upgrade was like, you need a lot more of the one drops to start looting as early as possible. Mm -hmm. Um, It did have good ramp to get them out uh, early, but if you weren't looting and you didn't have a a good enough graveyard, then his ability didn't matter. So that was something that I think um, it gave a lot of opportunities for growth, but out of the box, because it didn't quite leverage the commander uh, well enough, it not quite an S, but it's still a mm-hmm. solid A for me. Mm-hmm. Murph? Yeah, I give this an A as well. Um, primarily for me, just because it has the eminence ability. Yeah. Like, I do not think that this is something that we need to be going... the reason it wasn't an S? Well, that, yeah. that it wasn't an S, correct. Uh, yeah, this is something that I don't think we should be going back to. It's not something that we should be putting back on commanders. <laughs> to be fair, this is a slightly more fair version of it. It's more mm. on the like Arabo side of things as opposed to the Edgar side of things. Mm. But even so, having something that gives you something for free in the command zone without you even having to cast it, I don't think can lead to good places. Uh, I, like Honestly, I think the only way that they should ever do Eminence is like a downside 
ability. So eminence, as long as it's in your command zone, like it deals the damage to you or something like that. Sure. Yeah. Uh, to encourage you to play it, but encouraging people to not play it, yeah, I don't tough. think is good. Yeah. And, I and, that. and that's, that's a really good point. Like the fact that eminence is something that your opponents just straight up cannot interact Can't with at all it. is brutal. Yeah. Uh, even if they remove your commander, you're like, well, I still get this eminence ability. Mm -hmm. I will respect the fact that this was the first eminence commander where I wanted to play the commander. Mm. All the other eminence commanders, I was like, I'm probably just going to leave this in the command zone. And if something goes really, really wrong, I'll play it. Yeah. But this one was like, it has the eminence ability. And then I really want to get it into play. Yeah. Right. Uh, so I, I respect that because uh, that was something that they missed, I think, the first time. And yeah. they, they got right on this one. All of them were sort of like, yeah, if I put it in play, I just put it in jeopardy. Yeah, <laughs> like, exactly. I just can get it stolen. And this one, yeah, it gives you enough synergy. That's a great point. Uh, I also had an A for very similar reasons. I didn't. I think it is a dangerous to continue to add eminence to the commander pool. I don't ever want to be in a pod with like a ton of different eminent commanders. Uh, I don't think it was a good time for commander and I don't want to get back there. So, Fair uh, <laughs> sorry, no S rank. <laughs> yes. Bad mechanic. Final rank for this one is an A overall. Is this the first one that we all agreed on? Yes. Yes, it is. Oh, look at us. Starting Slightly off different reason, but yeah. we like this deck like, overall though. I mean, considering that's only the second group. <laughs> yeah. That's pretty good. Let's keep it moving. Uh, next is one of the four Jeskai decks. It's Kuzla, the broken hero in the divine convo vacation deck. Broken Halo. What did I say? Hero. Hero. Halo. She's yeah. a broken hero too. <laughs> a little Kuzla bit. the broken Halo. Uh, this is a red, white, blue convoke deck. So it's a token deck, but it had a ton of convoke spells and introduced a lot of new convoke cards, which was cool. Yep. Um, the bang for your buck here was $2.49. So a little below average. And the average price per reprint was $1.55. Not great. Mm, not amazing. No. The face commander, Kozla, is three blue, red, white for an angel ally. She's a 5 4 with Convoke, with Flying, Vigilance, and Haste. Haste. <laughs> <laughs> Whenever you cast another spell that has Convoke, scry two, then draw a card. You get a little preordained. I mean, Kozla is such a house. Yeah. <laughs> We've played against Kozla because yep. uh, Eric in the office has one. Yep. It's and fine. It, <laughs> it's I don't good. know. It's, it's pretty good. good. The thing is, uh, so I, I, I like that they gave Jeskai something different mm -hmm. in Convoke because uh, Jeskai didn't do Convoke before this. Right. It was always like a green-white ability. Mm -hmm. The issue was a lot of the best Convoke stuff was green and yeah. white. So uh, it definitely limited itself a little bit. You had some Convoke in the main set, which was cool, and Convoke in the deck, which I liked, but it's okay. Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't love it, but I don't hate it. Yeah. Uh, the most valuable reprint in this deck was Elspeth, Sun's Champion. Great reprint. Great reprint. She was sitting at $15 beforehand. Really powerful token card. The most played new card from this deck is Nesting Dovehawk, which was only in 7,543 decks on only? EDA track. 7,000 is a half of Chivalric Alliance. Like 7,000 is not, a house. It's not the main. Yeah, this card is incredible. That, <laughs> that card it should see a lot more play, especially because we just got all these food decks and stuff like that. Yeah. That card is fantastic. Yeah. It is For, very, very yeah. good. It was after watching the game nights where Jim Jimmy used it to great effect the yeah. Wilds of Eldraine one mm -hmm. where I'm like, I should probably I buy need to a get a couple Dove of those. Yeah. <laughs> Nesting Dovehawk, for those who haven't picked it up, if you aren't one of the 7,000, uh, it's a four mana 2 2 bird with flying. At the beginning of combat on your turn, populate. Whenever a creature token enters the battlefield under your control, put a plus one, plus one counter on Nesting Dovehawk. It's a big dove. It's yeah. a big yeah. dove. And it just keeps growing. And it keeps getting bigger. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and Jimmy had two. It was terrifying. <laughs> the card's great. Yeah. <laughs> really, really powerful. I thought this deck was really interesting. I Convoke is a is a neat thing to yeah. build around, especially when you can move at flash speed a yep. lot. Uh, it did have the it struggled with board wipes a lot. There mm -hmm. really wasn't a ton of pr protection yeah. in in the deck at all. And the problem with Convoke is everything's a little overcosted. Yeah. So if you lose your board, you're stuck with a bunch of overcosted spells in your hand. Yeah. Uh, that being said, I think Kozla was really neat, and I did b build the backup commander, which was Saint Traft and Rome Corollis. Yeah, that, those oh, were cool. they were really cool. They yeah. were very very different. So. Yeah, that's whenever it becomes tapped, it makes a different kind of token. So, yeah. And yeah. then untaps when you cast Convoke spells. Overall, I think people just didn't care. Yeah. No. I mean, I'm, I'm yeah. on that team. I didn't yeah. care. Uh, I what mean, what did go, you rank it? To, to go to my rating, I gave it a C because mm -hmm. I didn't care. Like, it's, yeah. it's fine. Yeah. Uh, and a big issue that I had with it was like, 
if you got it, there wasn't a ton of upgrades you could do to it with Convoke stuff, just because this isn't a Convoke color pair. Mm -hmm. um, so I didn't love that. Um, I do really like that they, again, gave Jeskai something else to do that isn't more controlling and stuff like that. Uh, it committed to the board, similar to the Knight's deck that we mm -hmm. talked about, which I enjoyed. Uh, I also really like that uh, because the commander has Convoke, all of your creatures end up being ramp. Um, for it, mm -hmm. which was made some really spicy picks where it's like, oh, I might play this like two mana spell that just makes two tokens. Um, and Manson did that. He played uh, the one that can make three if you like roll high from the onset yeah. or whatever. Mm -hmm. Manson did a great up upgrade for this. Yeah, I really, I really, really liked his upgrade yeah. for it. Um, so it's fine, but it, it's not one where I'd be like, man, you really need to go yeah. and play Kozla. <laughs> it's it's okay, but definitely pick up the Dove Hawk. The Dove yeah, Hawk is the exception. The Dove definitely pick Cards up the Dove really Hawk. Good. Dove Hawk. Yeah. You only pick up one thing, nesting Dove Hawk. There you Murph? go. Yeah, I also ranked it to see uh, for similar reasons to Damon in that there's just nowhere to go because I was talking to Manson because we work in the same room. Um, he was like, I just don't know how to upgrade this because yeah. there's no convoke cards that I can put in here that's not already in here. Mm -hmm. So it's there's just not much. There's nowhere really to go with it. Yeah. Like yeah. It's, a, it's a cool deck. It's a cool card, but it's not its not the strongest out of the box. Like, it's a strong enough commander, but yeah. I don't i don't think there's much you can do to push it mm -hmm. past its initial power level, uh, which I find a huge problem. And again, the average price per reprint, not great. Yep. Um, so there, there's not a ton of great reasons to pick this up unless you really like that commander. Or that, <laughs> or that Dove Hawk. Yeah. Or that Dove, or that Dove Hawk. Hawk. <laughs> Just go to cardcame.com slash command zone. Pick up that Dove Hawk. Pick yeah. up... <laughs> Get that dove hawk. <laughs> yeah. I gave this one a B. This what? is more of a personal preference. Uh, again, yes, the, the C, I think, is is a fair grade for it. Um, the bang for your buck and the average price per reprint are low, and it doesn't have that sort of longevity yeah. that you do yeah. want in a pre-con. But I really liked... This felt like a new flavor for Jeskai for me, where it was like Jeskai tokens, and it one with aggro and it gave you this like huge angel like a jeskai angel was really neat to me yeah and at um, least it's something different it is yeah it did feel true. fresh where it where it came out and it wasn't like a, the a jeskai spells deck mm -hmm. and i really do think that designers have struggled with jeskai over the years yeah like they it, all the jeskai commanders for like two years were like here's a red ability here's a blue ability here's yeah. a white ability yeah and you're like none of these work together yeah. <laughs> and i i liked that this felt jeskai and the deck felt jeskai without feeling broken broken and without feeling like super old yeah just yeah. guy tokens uh, is very much a thing yeah, yeah. it's you just usually play kai car which <laughs> yeah exactly. uh so overall we're giving this one a c which i think is fair yeah. also she's randomly an ally yeah she, i don't know yeah she doesn't have <laughs> she doesn't do the ally ability thing at all no nope. but she's an ally we love allies so yeah uh, All right, we have two more uh, from March of the Machine. The next is Brima's Blight of Arescos and the Growing Threat deck. This is a black-white Phyrexians <laughs> slash artifact creatures deck. Yeah. <laughs> it's bang for your buck value was $2.14 uh, low, and its average price per reprint was $1.22. The which worst I, of the year. I will tell you, yeah, it is, uh, <laughs> spoiler alert, this is the worst quality of reprint in, in any deck that came out this year. Woof. Of the 25. Brimaz, of course, got Phyrexianized. <laughs> Poor guy. He's he's icky and drippy in this one. He's two white black for a Phyrexian cat. He's a 3-4 whenever you cast a Phyrexian creature or artifact creature spell. Incubate X where X is that spell's mana value. At the beginning of each end step, if a Phyrexian died under your control this turn, proliferate. We're doing a lot. We got yeah. a lot of words. We, all of them. Artifact creatures or Phyrexians <laughs> also counters mm -hmm. or of some variety and dying. Yep. Yep. It goes a lot of different places. <laughs> and you also, the artifact thing, and then you yeah. flip them later, and they have varying power and yeah. toughness based on what you cast. Yeah. It's a lot. The most valuable reprint in this deck. <laughs> I can't believe this card's $7. I can't it believe this card was in this deck. <laughs> ancient Stone Idol. Why is this card in here? Yeah, why is it in here? It's and an why artifact is it, creature. And why is it... The, with a dice trigger. To, to, make, to make a big incubator token. I guess. Yes. That is exactly why. It Just is. With this. It, this <laughs> yes, is it's point. better than an incubator token. It <laughs> is such a bizarre include in this deck, and it's very weird that it was seven dollars, but it was. So I'm guess I'm glad it was reprinted. I do like this card. Yeah, for all of you it's ancient cool stone idol stands, you rejoice. I guess. Yep. 
The most played new card is actually super sweet. It's Bitterthorn, Nissa's Animus. It's in almost 18,000 decks on EDA track. This is a living equipment. It's a legendary living equipment. Equip creature gets plus one, plus one. Whenever an equip creature attacks, you may search your library for a basic land, put it onto the battlefield. Tap, then shuffle, equip three. Yeah, it's a sword of the Animus that you comes in as a creature, which yeah. is really cool. It's, Love it. it's been a staple in my equipment decks and, mm-hmm. and a lot of people's equipment decks. It's great. I love living weapon, especially really playable abilities. Yeah. Put it in deck on black blades. Any yep. type of ramp that you can get. Yeah. I'll take good. it. I will take it. Play <laughs> ramp and colorless. It. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I loved this card. But the weird thing about this card in this deck yeah. is it doesn't like it doesn't trigger your commander at all. Yeah, it's not an artifact yeah. creature. It is a Phyrexian that you didn't cast. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The like, only thing you get is if you move it, I guess a Phyrexian will have died. I suppose. And that's it. <laughs> but other than that it doesn't Combo. work yeah, yeah. uh <laughs> that's true what the heck this deck was a mess uh yeah. i re- i remember lo- going through the the list and you were like we're going this all goes this way yep. this and all this goes all this goes way, this way yep. and there's yeah. no sack outlets yeah because I, I we did the uh pre-con upgrade for mm-hmm. this particular one and i was like well you probably want to go either phyrexian or artifacts mm-hmm. and just pick a lane and do your best with that yeah that being said uh, there is a pretty sweet Brimaz deck in the office. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, Garov has one. It's Garov very has, good. It's really good. It's it feels sneaky, great. terrifying. It's cool. Yeah. Uh, but out of the box, I thought this deck was a disaster. It was not super playable. It was really expensive. Like, <laughs> I don't know. A disaster seems yeah, cool. no, Tell us how you really feel, it Rachel. It was not good. It was not good. <laughs> it wasn't great. But out I don't of think it was all a of the March of the Machine decks, this one was like, what is going on? <laughs> It has Ancient Stone Idol and Bitterthorn Nissa's Animus it does. It does in the deck, that. and they All don't right. work. Yeah. I just thought there were so many cards. Like It was the closest to an old pre-con where we had half the deck did one thing <laughs> and half the deck did another. But honestly, I kind of like that. Yeah. <laughs> it's very customizable. <laughs> it's customizable. There's lots of different ways you can go with it. Yeah. Who's the backup commander for this? Do you have any idea? <sighs> Was this Tashar and it Moira? Was, yes. Yes. It was. It was Tashar and Moira. That was like a yeah. historic commander. <laughs> yeah. Which it, it, artifacts? Sure, it was doing a lot. Sure. I think I, <laughs> think think I pulled it. We pulled it out of the. Uh, I think we did for, yeah. <laughs> for the upgrade. All right, uh, I didn't like this deck clearly, but Damon, what did you think? Uh, so uh, controversial. I gave it a B. A mm. B. I gave it a B. That's and I, high. And <laughs> there's the main reason was every uh, when I played this deck uh, as as the precon, I had fun. Mm-hmm. I felt like I was always doing something, mm-hmm. which felt good. And I, I really like the incubate mechanic. It reminds me a little bit of like my vehicles deck where you have this sort of hard to interact with thing always available to you mm-hmm. that, you know, if somebody wraths or whatever, you're like, oh, I'm not just blown out. I have all these creatures now that I've just let sit around. It did the proliferate thing, which was fun. So I just liked that the deck felt like I was doing something Mm -hmm. and don't get me wrong it wasn't very powerful or anything like that but i interacted with the game i had fun Mm -hmm. every time i played it and then to add to that definitely a little bit of bias because of how strong garov's deck was it is really cool that like with this deck you could hand it to someone and be like you're gonna have a ton of options of how you upgrade this you can go full artifacts you can go for phyrexians and it's it's fun Mm -hmm. it's it's just a really Mm -hmm. enjoyable way to do orzov in a way that felt different than a lot of the orzov decks of the past it's certainly different so for me that gave it a b i totally respect it's not fantastic out of the box Mm -hmm. but it's it was fun and Mm -hmm. so for me that gave it the solid b murph yeah i gave it a c um I'm, I am don't think I'm as low on it as you are, Rachel, but... <laughs> Rachel hates it. Yeah. I didn't. She hates cats. I was frustrated. You heard it here deck. first. Rachel I, hates cats. I mean, I, I agree with Damon that there's just a lot of fun, cool things about this deck. As it comes, it has some problems, most notably with the reprints and it's splitting multiple directions. Mm-hmm. But I think that it's a passable enough commander mm-hmm. deck that you can, like you said, hand to somebody and they can go somewhere with it and it's going to be fun and it's going to be cool. Mm-hmm. I just think this deck had such a long way to go from like a, f- a pre-con off the shelf to a deck that was powerful and fun to play. Um, like we, it, I, it was the first pre-con of the year where I was like, I would take more slots and more like more cards in and more cards out. Yeah, yeah more than um, the 10. Yeah, yeah, most of the time, like we're fine with 10, but it felt like it needed more work. I mean, even, even with the and 10 that we have, like, did, it was fine. If they had put a worm coil engine in this deck. Dude, that would have been great. That then been cool. then this, awesome. deck, this deck is like immediately, you're like, I understand what's happening. Yeah, but And it has a better didn't. reprint than Ancient Stone Eye. Yeah. And at the time, <laughs> yeah, and Why? at the time, like the worm coil C14. engine was only like 12 bucks or yeah. something like that. Like it was very easy to make this deck better. Yeah. And they... Didn't, it, didn't. It, they yeah. didn't. It was a mess. Yeah. Uh, so I give this one a D, which means overall it's a C. Murph wins 
For yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I'm average. <laughs> One more deck uh, from March of the Machine. It's Tinker Time, oh, everybody. Oh, it's Tinker Time. Uh, Tinker Time was a red, green, blue artifact tokens deck um, <laughs> with Gimbal Gremlin Prodigy in the <laughs> command zone. <laughs> Anybody have any idea what Gimbal does? <laughs> no, I had to check yeah. <laughs> when we started this because I, like when we, when this was spoiled, I was like, oh, look at that. Gremlins, let's go. No. Kaladesh Gremlins. Woo. Yeah. yeah. And then it happened and I was like, no, that's not... <laughs> That's not quite what I thought it would yeah. be. And then yeah. I just never have seen it played. Yeah. yeah. For those listening at home, <laughs> two, it, it, Gimbal is two green, blue, red for a gremlin artificer 4-4. Four, four, and that is where the fun ends. <laughs> artifact, <laughs> artifact creatures you control have trample. Okay. At the beginning of your end step, create a zero, zero red gremlin artifact creature token. Put X plus one plus one counters on it where X is the number of differently named artifact tokens you control. Okay, so this is like if you have a, a clue and a treasure and a food, yeah. then you make a 3-3. Three, three. Yep. And it has trample. Um, Remember when gremlins like ate artifacts yeah, in Kaladesh? Yeah, the gremlins were anti-artifacts. Yeah, the whole fumigate thing was because they kept eating the artifacts and they had to get rid of them. Yeah, I don't, he loves them. But he loves them. And he's You're, like, uh, You are what you eat and everything he'd eaten was brilliant. <laughs> so I guess he, he also. Artifacts. I guess he ate them. But so why much. doesn't he sacrifice them? Flavor fail. Flavor I don't fails. know. Yeah, I don't. Gremlins, I'm not convinced. Gremlins or Gimbal's <laughs> sort of bizarre. Um, and it came right after um, Brothers were where they printed Urza that yeah. Yeah. also did artifact creatures. It was like artifact creatures have menace, and it gave you yeah. constructs which are just way bigger. Yeah, and, and change. And that was like six mana, but you could cast it for three. Yeah. This card was like, we'd seen it before. And also it was confusing. And I would have, I would have done a lot to play a gremlin artificer. And then I looked at it and was like, ah, shit. To be fair, it's different for teamer. It's different. Right. Tireless Tracker was the <laughs> most valuable reprint at five dollars and fifty cents. Spoiler alert: that is the worst uh, wow. reprint of the year, uh, the worst highest reprint of the year. Anyway, yeah, that's really really low. Tireless Tracker is an incredibly powerful card, but it is not the kind of value that we hope to see in these precons, mm -hmm. and that means that the rest of the cards were probably very low quality. And they were, yeah. Average <laughs> price per reprint was one dollar and twenty five cents. Yeah. So generally, the card quality was just not quite there. Yeah. Mm. So, I mean, what would you rank this? Um, I gave this a solid F. <laughs> F because All I up. did not like it. I did not like playing it out of the box, and I could not tell somebody you're gonna new player buy this deck. You're gonna have fun, and you're gonna love it. Yeah. And also, I'm sorry that you you have to upgrade it. What are you going to do with it? I don't know. I didn't figure it out, so I don't know that you will. Uh, so F, I, I, yeah. it's just bad. <laughs> uh, Hedron Detonator, I forgot to say, was the most played new oh. card, um, which was sort of a worse version of an yeah. effect we already had. And that it's only an 8,667 uh, decks on EDA Trek. Uh, that being said, Murph. Yes. Uh, uh, rank? Yeah. Rank yeah. It. I ranked it a D. Uh, yeah. I, th I think F's a little bit harsh. Uh, for what it's worth, I have this deck. Mm -hmm. and do you? Yes. Sweet. My sister, never seen yeah. who does not play Magic, yeah. okay. I gave this to her to play because it was just a pre-con that I had that was opened. Sure. Okay. So I know what the new player experience with this is. Yeah. And it's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> it's actively <laughs> awful. It was yeah. probably the worst thing I could have done. Yeah. I'll just give her one of my already existing decks probably would have been better, even though most of them are not very good. Yeah. Uh, but I do like the differently named tokens aspect of this, and I like that it has green mm -hmm. as a part of it. That's not something that you usually see when it, you're doing something that cares about artifacts. Sure. So there's a lot of cool things that I like about the commander, so I don't think it's a complete failure. But yeah, at the end of the day, the deck is a hot mess. Yeah. Uh, I also gave this one an F. I, I really agree. There was a lot to that had sparked hope for yeah. me where I was like, I like the differently named tokens thing. I like that. It's recognizing sort of the junk archetype that commander players are really interested in mm -hmm. yeah. and giving you a different payoff for it. Yeah. Um, I didn't think the payoff was good enough and I thought it was really hard to execute on. And, um, the deck itself was unplayable and not worth your money, uh, which means I, I, I think command zone marks it an F F uh, F, F 
plus. One other for thing, Murph's all sister. of these, all <laughs> for Murph's sister. Mm. Uh, one thing, all of these decks had really low reprint value. All of these decks also had plane chase, which means they had more than a hundred cards to yep. add to that reprint value, which really goes to show how low the reprint value was for all of those decks. Yeah. Uh, I remember doing the reprint upgrades for this and a lot of the like listed as notable reprints were planes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Like that is not a good You don't want that. that. I'm like That's what's that card? Good. Oh, oh it's a right. plane chase card. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. Oh, it was nice that they printed plane chase and I liked that they used it this year and I was just Twice. so disappointed Twice, yeah. in, in these decks. At the time, I think I really wanted to be engaged by them. And yeah. at, in retrospect, they were, I think this was the worst set of precons of the year just sort of overall and there was the most of them there's mm -hmm. five yeah there's a lot yeah uh okay uh we have talked about only two sets believe it or not uh oh we are going to talk about a lot more pre-cons but first we have a few words from our sponsors don't go away you know what every magic player loves a two for one Ugh, getting that value over your opponents feels amazing yeah two for ones are great but you know what's even better value this holiday season mm -hmm. mint mobile Right now, when you buy any three-month Mint Mobile plan, you can get three more months for free. That's six months of premium wireless service for the price of only three. Whoa, a six for three? So the legends are true. Of course, with Mint Mobile, the value's already there. Plans start at just 15 bucks a month and all come with unlimited talk, text, and data on the nation's largest 5G network. Unlimited? That's like going infinite. It's easy to switch over your old phone, and if you do need a new one, you can get six months of free service when you buy a select device and plan, but only for a limited time. Limited time? We're on a two-turn clock. We gotta act fast. Exactly. So switch to Mint Mobile today and take advantage of their best deals of the year. You know what magic term that sounds like? What? A win. For a limited time, buy any three-month Mint Mobile plan and get three more months free by going to mintmobile.com slash command. Cut your wireless bill to 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash command. <laughs> Hear that? The roar of the adoring crowd. Victor is back, and I'm as enthralling as ever. Hey, my eyes are up here. Just kidding. I don't shave my impeccable chest so people won't look. No, I groom this smooth bod using Manscaped. Their Performance Package 5.0 Ultra is the ultimate holiday bundle for the man who deserves it all. And that man is me. It comes complete with the Lawnmower 5.0 Ultra, the Weed Whacker 2.0 Ear and Nose Trimmer, and oh, so much more. Both trimmers feature advanced skin-safe technology, so the only cuts I fear come from my opponent's blades. Ha! They wish. Plus, with Manscaped, I can make sure I smell as good as I look thanks to their Crop Soother Aftershave Lotion. Now I'm looking sharp, dangerous, and ready for that mistletoe. So if you know anyone who wants to be as enthralling as me this holiday season, get them the Manscaped Performance Package 5.0. Or just grab one for you. Nothing wrong with being a little self-centered, I always say. To myself, I love me. Get 20% off and free shipping with the code CommandZone at Manscaped.com. That's 20% off with free shipping at Manscaped.com and use code CommandZone. Manscaped, get all of yourself ready for the holidays. <gasps> Josh, do you hear that sound? Is that bells? Oh no, not again! That's right, it's gift buying season! Ah, wait, it's not that bad. I'll just buy stuff from Raycon. Yeah. We've been recommending Raycon wireless earbuds for years on this podcast. They make great gifts for any music or podcast lover, and their batteries last all day. I use mine constantly. And this year, you can find even more of your gift list through Raycon, since they've expanded their business to include Raycon Home and PowerTech. They still earn their reputation for high quality and low price, but with way more products like their Magic 180 charging cable. It provides hyperspeed charging for all your devices, iOS, micro USB, and Type-C included. Plus, it rotates 180 degrees and is built to last. Oh, I could use one of those for myself. All right. That's one gift down right away. Wait, you're on your own gift list? Self-care is important, Jimmy. Yeah. Hurry now to buyraycon.com slash command to get 15% off your entire Raycon order. Perfect for last minute gifts or to ring in the new year. That's buyraycon.com slash command to get 15% off Raycon products. Again, buyraycon.com slash command. Welcome back, everybody. It's time to get into Lord of the Rings. Did you like those ads? I thought they were pretty neat. Pretty good. Pretty funny. Yeah. Good job, boys. <laughs> you did it. <laughs> uh... Lord of the Rings was a huge set this year. Obviously, there was four pre-cons. They were all Lord of the Rings skinned. Uh, the first one we're going to talk about is Elven Council. This is a green-blue elves slash voting deck <laughs> with the face commander Galadriel Elven Queen. 
Uh, Galadriel was a 4-5 for two, a green, and a blue. She's an elf noble with will of the council. At the beginning of combat on your turn, if another elf entered the battlefield under your control this turn, starting with you, each player votes for Dominion or Guidance. If Dominion gets more votes, the ring tempts you. Then you put a plus one counter on your ring bearer. If Guidance gets more votes or the vote is tied, draw a card. <laughs> Thanks for that essay, Rachel. And now Woo! back to uh, Magic the Gathering podcast. That's, that's Galadriel. Uh, the bang for your buck value of this deck was two dollars and 89 cents uh pretty good above average yeah they put some really cool cards in here which i really liked because it meant that you had like powerful cards in lord of the rings flavor yep. and yes. you could build like a full playable lord of the rings deck with real commander cards yeah ton of staples it was awesome yeah uh and that is reflected in its most valuable reprint which was heroic intervention at 23 dollars good card and it is also reflected by its average price per reprint, which was $2.95, almost $3, a full dollar higher than the average reprint yeah. like of the year. That's yeah. very good. Uh, the most played new card was Raise the Palisade. It was in 13,000 decks on EDA Trek. Uh, if you're not familiar with this one, it is a five mana blue sorcery that says choose creature type, return all creatures that aren't of the chosen type to their owner's hands. This one card? busted yeah this card nuts like wizards yeah. print this asap reprint this it, it's not specifically lord of the rings flavored please reprint yeah, it we need it <laughs> we know that commander <laughs> players love decks based around creature types and so this is going to go in any of those that are blue yeah it's Keep awesome dominance for five mana <laughs> what yes yeah. we like that it's <laughs> gonna be played please reprint it already thanks appreciate Ooh. it okay um of the lord of the rings decks yeah and this one was the worst out of the box by far in terms of power level. Yep. Mm -hmm. Agreed. And w I, th I think it was because they were very, very worried about elves. Yeah. Because elves is already a strong they didn't want an thing elf on ball its own. Specifically. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Uh, elves is a really powerful archetype and commander. And um, if they had just put a bunch of good elves cards in the deck, this one would have been significantly more powerful yes. than the other ones. So they kind of muddied the waters with all these voting cards and sort of overcosted everything. Yeah. And there was a lot of weird side quests. And then it also had sort of a scry sub theme, which was a main theme of the set, yep. but wasn't, didn't show up a lot in the deck. No, just a little bit. A little bit. Yeah. Uh, this was the biggest mess yeah. for me uh, of Lord of the Rings. Mm -hmm. That being said, I'm obsessed with these decks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, you have like all of them set up, yeah. ready to go. <laughs> Rachel shows up at lunch and is like, you want to play with my Lord of the Rings You want to play Lord of the Rings decks? Yeah. Play Lord or do you want to play your own decks? Cry. <laughs> Lame. <laughs> we we, we want to play Lord of the Rings decks, right? Right, yeah. everybody? <laughs> Who can I bully? <laughs> um, yeah, I, I bought all of the Lord of the Rings decks I wanted to do in-world upgrades for all of them. And the elf one I have done, I've done like four different drafts of to get it to a place where I felt like it was as playable as the other ones. It needs the most work, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. definitely. Uh, but super high value, really like cool deck overall and introduced a really powerful new card and had really strong reprints. That being said, Damon. Uh, so I gave this one a D. Yeah. Um, I have all of these pre-cons. I, I bought all of them. And this was the one where like I played it and it's like, I'm not having fun. Mm -hmm. um, everything has a bunch of text on it. It doesn't do a lot of cross synergy. Galadriel needs another elf in order to get any effect, which is like, why? Yeah. You know, she's a four drop, four or five. She's not crazy or anything. And the ability is good, but not a, not insane or anything. And so I, I just, I went, every time I played it, I felt like I had to balance a million different things and I wasn't really doing anything mm -hmm. that was worthwhile so it's just i just didn't have a lot of fun playing this i and if i did want to keep playing it it would require a ton of work for mm -hmm. me to feel confident about it so um for me i just it's a d mm -hmm. i didn't love it yeah um i i, I don't think uh, i'm not quite as harsh on this deck because i gave this one a c mm -hmm. i think that it has Tons of, like you said, great reprints, all Lord of the Rings skinned, and just for that, it can be worthwhile to some people. Uh, but again, you are right, Damon, that the deck doesn't play super great out of the box. But I think that for what it gives you, that's uh, more than passable. Mm hmm yeah, I, I gave this one a C. Uh, I thought this one passed. I think like all of these decks have a lot to offer and are yep. really like strong products overall. I was disappointed that this wasn't a strong deck um, because, yeah, it 
it looks like they were really careful with it. Yeah. Because they they also had, I, I didn't even mention it, they also had the like cast a thing that's five mana or more was in yep. it. Yep. It was voting and cast big spells and elves. It was just split all over the place. And it, it, was, it was a mess. It took a lot of work to get it into a place that I felt super happy with it. But mm-hmm. it was a product that really excited me and it was a product that I do think a lot of people looked at and were like, elves, like yep. cool. Uh, so for me, it had a lot going for it. But that being said, I think this one gets a C. Yeah. Moving on to food and fellowship. This is the abs and the second abs and deck of the year. It's the hobbitses. <laughs> so green, white, black, it's hobbits and food. Uh, the bang for your buck here was $2 and 17 cents, which is pretty low actually, yeah. especially yeah. for the Lord of the Rings decks overall. The average price per reprint was $1 and 97 cents. So pretty close to average. The bang for your buck values on Lord of the Rings cards are decks are a little skewed because they're only based on reprints and there's a lot of mechanically new cards yeah so you have higher than basically every other deck right so you're counting fewer cards in that number than you are for most of the other decks Mm -hmm. so the average price per per reprint shows that it's about average in terms of card quality Uh, the face commanders were frodo adventurous hobbit and sam loyal attendant frodo says if you've gained three or more life this turn uh the ring tempts you then if frodo is your ring bearer and the ring has tempted you two or more times this turn draw a card so it's life gain and sam makes food and helps you eat the food which helps frodo draw cards uh (laughs) the most valuable reprint of the deck was toxic deluge great at 19 dollars you'll love to see it you really do also new art for toxic i'm here for it thank goodness yeah and that's a huge thing with all these decks they all have a unique art Mm -hmm. which is sick yeah the most played new card was the gaffer. The gaffer. Yes, you did it, granddad. And that's for my old gaffer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he is uh, in almost 12,000 decks on EDA track. He says, it, at the beginning of each end step, if you gain three or more life this turn, draw a card. It's yeah. a great life to gain payoff. Yep. And we got a f- even more food stuff, so it just goes in a ton of decks. Yeah. This deck was awesome. Yeah. I think everybody was excited like this was the most popular of the decks. Yeah, this is the one I had the hardest time acquiring because yeah. uh, it was sold yeah. out all over the place. It mm-hmm. was it became the most expensive because everybody's buying it, mm-hmm. and it was just so much fun. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So Mary and Pippin were the backup commanders. They're also quite strong. Yep, yep. Uh, Frodo, with each other. Frodo and Sam aren't as powerful, but are a really nice engine on very cheap commanders. Yeah. Yes. And Two I and think three. that was this also this also had uh, Farmer Cotton, which is a busted magic card. Yeah. <laughs> that card is ridiculous. What if I just made all the foods and all the yeah, if creature we're talking, tokens if we're talking about fine. like rectangle theory yeah like, it did all it makes one million rectangles <laughs> yeah like ah <laughs> um yeah i i thought this deck was super funny and super flavorful and had a bunch of characters that you were excited about and it had a food mechanic which was funny and fun to play powerful stuff um this was like everything i wanted to see in a new in a commander pre-con yeah um what grade did you give it damon I give it an S. I thought S. this deck Ooh. was fantastic. Um, mm-hmm. I again, I, I was able to pick it up eventually, but and when I finally did, it's like, oh my god, this was worth the wait. Mm-hmm. This is just so much fun. I'm doing things. I'm always interacting with the board. The, the commanders being cheap meant you got in early and you never really felt like you were behind. But it also didn't feel like crazy busted. The reprints were solid. The Lord of the Rings flavor was awesome and. Right after this, or not immediately after this, but pretty soon after this, we got Woe, which Mm -hmm. gave you even more food stuff. So even if you decided, you know what, Sam and Frodo, I had my fun with you, I'm good, you could take a ton of these cards and put it into your new food decks if Mm -hmm. you built any of those. Mm -hmm. And so like this deck just felt like a slam dunk to me. Like I could very confidently tell somebody, go buy this. You're going to have an amazing time. If you want to upgrade it, you have a ton of choices. And if you don't and you want the pizzas, that's fine too. You have great great, uh, Mm -hmm. tools in here. So for me, S all the way. Murph? Yeah. Um, I, I also thought this deck was quite strong. Uh, I gave it an A mm-hmm. uh, just because, like, yeah, it does have Toxic Deluge, uh, but its overall reprint value is just not amazing compared yeah. to some of the other stuff yeah. that we see in these Commander decks. And honestly, if that was fixed, then this would receive a solid S from me. Yeah. I uh, I gave this one an S as well. Um, 
I like I said, I, I was really high on this deck, and I thought it was a ton of fun. It had a lot of personality, um, and like Damon said, it had a lot of really amazing pieces that went into other decks. We're seeing Farmer Cotton a lot. We're seeing the yep. Gaffer clearly a lot. Yep. Um, these are relevant cards, and especially the new cards were really relevant, even if the reprints weren't quite as high as the other decks yep. of this kind. So uh, this is going to be our very first. S of the year. Yeah, let's go. You did it, Frodo. S for Sam. S for Sam. Sam. <laughs> All the decks are going to be like, don't go where I can't follow. <laughs> <laughs> if I take one more step, this will be the farthest from home I've ever been. <laughs> I'm like, ah, we'll throw some Lord of the Rings in there somewhere. <laughs> yes, I have seen the most popular trilogy of all time. Thank you very much. Oh, on the up and up. <laughs> uh, maybe Star Wars is actually the uh, original Star Wars trilogy. That's probably more popular. Probably. Eh. I don't know. Lord of the Rings. It's hard. Lord of the Rings is pretty popular. The anyway. Are great. More Lord uh, of the Rings. <laughs> let's keep moving with another Jeskai banger. Jeskai! Eowyn, Shield Maiden, uh, and the Riders of Rohan deck. This is blue, white, red. It was a humans slash monarch deck. The bang for your buck here was $2.58. So right on average, even despite it having being a little bit lower. Its uh, average price per reprint was $2.30. So good quality reprints in this deck across the board. Eowyn Shield Maiden herself was really powerful. She's really good. So good. She's really, a five really four. Good. She's a five mana five four first strike. Yeah. At the beginning of combat on your turn, if another human entered the battlefield under your control this turn, you make two 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 red human knight creature tokens with trample and haste. <laughs> Then, <laughs> sure. Then, if you control six or more humans, draw a card. Remember, you already have four. Yeah, you have four <laughs> minimum. <laughs> like you play one more, you got it. <laughs> yeah, you have Aowen, and then you played one to trigger the ability, and okay. bada bing, bada boom, ah! you're almost there. <laughs> the most played new card from this deck was Taunt from the Rampart, which is only in nine thousand decks, despite being it is a Boros card, so that's part of it. That one's go to all creatures your opponents control until your next turn. Those creatures can. Can't block this card also nuts i love very, this very card good. it's a, it's I'm a better super destructive high on this one. and yeah. that card is already great yeah uh and i skipped over it but the best reprint of the deck was combat celebrant which was 20 dollars at time of uh Woo. yeah and a great human great human <laughs> so, got I, Lord rings art lovely man yeah this deck slapped yeah yeah so good like your opponents in the face yeah <laughs> over and over and over again <laughs> repeatedly until yeah. they died yeah uh, I have played this one in a pre-con setting, like in an up, un-upgraded pre-con setting multiple times, and this deck has won like three out of the four times. Because it actually does things. It's yeah. so there, aggressive. There are some pre-cons where they're like, I'm going to do the thing, and it's going to generate me value, but oftentimes in a pre-con environment, the decks that will just attack are the decks that win. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's just how it goes. And it draws cards. Yeah. It's it replaces just... the human that you just played to trigger the ability. Yeah. If yeah. you have enough. Oh, it's so good. The backup commander was Aragorn which is was monarch based and yeah. uh also very good aragorn's though. super sweet yeah. he's great yeah uh overall great damon uh this one was another s for me uh, it was amazing out of the box so fun so powerful the fact that the main strategy was a jeskai aggro deck which was unique for jeskai it's not control at all and the backup mechanic being monarch which synerg synergizes so well with aggro decks it was just like a match made in heaven every mm. time i play this deck i'm like i'm having a blast mm. and the the reprint value is great it has fourth aerolingus in it which is yeah. an absurd card i can't believe fourth aerolingus isn't the most played new card in these decks. yeah so, so like like every, this deck is just awesome it's a slam dunk mm -hmm. and so like yeah it's, it's great if you haven't played it play it and uh i again highly recommend it it's just a blast yeah yeah murph uh, uh i gave this one an a uh, mm -hmm. i agree with damon that it's a very 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 cool deck uh we did the deck upgrade for this one yeah uh the thing that we noted is that uh you did say that the monarch synergizes as well with the attacking ability of it uh i just think that there's a little bit too much with that monarch, there's like sure. six clunky, six to ten like clunky monarch cards mm -hmm. when you really, really want to be playing humans. And so uh, in playtesting, I found that you can just be sitting there with a couple monarch cards in hand. And you're like, yeah, but I really would love just like a human, please. Yeah, two mana, two, two human. Would I'll be... take a four mana human yeah, <laughs> at yeah. this point. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of brought it down a little bit, uh, at least in my eyes. Mm -hmm. But I still think probably a plus if we could give it that i also like that they did attach the monarch to a lot of human creatures mm -hmm. which yeah. was cool yeah it felt nice yeah at least like aragorn's got that monarch thing going so yeah. I, I i love that overlap but like the i think it had courts in there yeah the, those are not 
what I want to see in this deck. Oh, sure. The red court in in a precon setting was a beating. Yeah, because <laughs> you're like, kill that thing, kill that thing. Yeah, Whoop, you're like seven to the face. Yeah. <laughs> and you're like, what? Yeah, <laughs> stop it. Yeah. Um, yeah, I I gave this one an A as well. I I loved so many of the pieces of this deck. I thought the new, like the mechanically new cards in this deck were a little underwhelming mm. uh, because they were so monarch focused and a sure. lot of them were overcosted that they just didn't quite get into the bloodstream. Um, but Taunt from the Rampart and Fourth Aerolingus are obviously so good. So really, absurd. really awesome. Um, the rest of them, I just couldn't even name them to you. There's like one that's like a control magic that has a monarch thing on oh, it. Oh yeah, that, yeah, that yeah. card's not good. Which is weird. <laughs> that card's um, so I I think because of that, and again, because of that um, disconnect between like be trying to attack and also trying to defend yeah. the monarch is a tough balance to strike. I did give it an A. Uh, that being said, when I was trying to build like a, a like an environment where all the precons felt relatively balanced, I was like, I'm going to throw some weird stuff in this deck just to slow it down a little oh, bit. Oh, really? Yeah. Because it's so much faster yeah. and more aggressive. Like this yeah. one just smushes the Hobbit deck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but they have food. They can gain life for each. You're like, I have no, one three. It doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah. This deck is great. It's, it's awesome. so fun. Yeah. It's yeah. so powerful. Overall, command zone A. A for awesome. Let's move on to the baddies. It's the first Grixis deck we're going to talk about, right? Yeah. yeah. Of the year, this is the Hosts of Mordor. Of Mordor. Black, red, blue for an orc slash reanimator slash spell slinger deck. <laughs> uh, the bang for your buck here was $2.49. The average price per reprint was $2.30. Uh, both of those just a hair, well, uh, $2.50 was a hair under average. $2.30 is pretty is pretty good. Yeah. Uh, it gives us a, a slightly above average quality of reprint print the face commander of course was sauron lord of the rings such a cool name. let's go and of course he's a eight drop nine nine avatar horror when you cast this spell a mass orcs five mill five cards then return a creature card from your graveyard to the battlefield that's a cast trigger <laughs> uh then trample whenever a commander and opponent controls dies the ring tempts you uh that's the face commander the backup was saruman who specifically cared about non-creature spells and orcs yep. uh the most valuable reprint in the deck was reanimate at 16 dollars. solid got some cool like uh sauron reanimate yeah art it's great and the most impactful new card was the Black Gate in almost 20,000 decks on EDA track. Ooh. This is a legendary black land. As it enters, you may pay three life. If you don't, it enters tapped. It taps to add black, and it has an activated ability that says one in a black tap. Choose a player with the most life or tied for the most life. Target creature can't be blocked by creatures that player controls this turn. Pretty yeah, Pretty good. Yeah. I mean, it's a land it can go in basically anything that wants yeah. to deal damage in I mean, it's like a super Shizo kind of. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to say, it feels like Shizo. I, I also like that. Something. I like this card. It's pretty good, right? Yeah. I, I also like this, that yeah. it gives you a way to reduce your life total if you were the had the most life, there which is know. like actually an upside Clever. with it. Yeah. Um, it's just great. It's yeah. great. Uh, really cool card. This deck was a bit of a mess as well. It had a lot of different directions. It, yeah, like it was definitely. doing reanimator stuff and had big fatties to reanimate. It also had like super high CMC sorceries, but then it also had like gutter snipe yeah which you're like this is a storm card what are <laughs> yeah. you doing here yeah and then it had the like the goblin that etbs and makes three goblins yep. yeah and you're like i don't what are, uh <laughs> yeah so there were some just sort of red herrings in the deck that made it a little bit difficult to focus what it was really about mm -hmm. uh ultimately i think it's a reanimator deck that has like some spell stuff going on yeah uh, in terms of rating, I gave this one a C. I thought it was fine. Mm. It's like passable. It's, it is a little, it is very clunky. It has a lot of expensive stuff. So a lot of the times when I was playing it, it's like, I feel like I'm not really interacting with this game, uh, for a good part of the early game. And then all of a sudden I'm interacting a bunch, but then even then it's like, you guys all get to double spell and I'm casting my eight drop commander, which kind of feels rough. Like it's very powerful. Mm. But he cost eight. Yeah. You know, and sure, you're doing the reanimation thing, which helps, but it didn't feel like there was quite enough uh, focus on it to really make it feel great when you were sitting down at a commander uh, table mm -hmm. uh, just out of the box. So for me, just to see, it's okay. Murph? Yeah. I give it a B. Um, uh, 
I felt like whenever anybody sits down with a pod of these four decks, uh, I still feel like the elves is the one that people shy away from the most. Mm -hmm. uh, because at the very least with this, you are playing Sauron, the Lord of the Rings. It's Sick! cool. It is it, very cool. It's cool. It's fun when you're playing it. Sure, it's a little bit clunky, but who cares? You're having a great time playing big spells, whether they be creature, non-creature. And yeah, there are definitely problems with this that uh, could have been alleviated. Uh, but overall, I think just the cool factor and fun factor of everything gives it a B for me. Yeah. And yep. being evil is cool. Being evil is cool. That's it fun. Cool. Uh, I gave this one a C because I did think uh, the the parts were a little disjointed and there was a number of cards that I was like, well, take that out immediately and find <laughs> most other things put in it. Um, but I, I wanted to mention that a lot of people were like, I wish this Sauron was cheaper. And it's like, no, no, no. this is Sauron, yeah. the Lord of the Rings. It costs eight to get him here and he gives you a 5-5 five five and reanimates another creature. It's cheaper yeah. Sauron's in the main set. Yeah, Go like, play those if you yeah, want. Yeah, you got those. This one feels big yeah. and like a, you're like oh no yeah, he's yeah. here and like that impact felt really important to me yeah uh so he's still in the command zone of of the the precons that yeah. i built and that is and, important. Uh, he felt makes like him really the, cool he felt like the looming threat yeah. that's yeah. like you know he's coming like that's always that's, that's gonna so come flavorful. down yeah it's great yeah i love it uh, that's why i think it's a b i don't know yeah you all look crazy <laughs> yeah you're right I, I, it's this deck felt really sick and it was frustrating because there's a couple of cards in it that you're like i don't know what to do with this but um it also had a ton of board wipes a ton yeah uh overall we're gonna give this one a c but ton of fun all the lord of the rings decks i was just like over the moon c for cool c for cool c for cool it's cool to be evil yeah you heard it here first <laughs> all right we are gonna move on to the most contentious precons of the year it's commando masters Ooh. Starting with the Eldrazi Unbound deck. This was a colorless precon, the first of its kind. Um, it Spang for your buck was $1.94 of reprint value for every $1 spent. And that's if you got it at a good price. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> its average price for reprint was $2.07. Bang on average. <laughs> For a deck that cost twice as $80, much, eighty dollars, one hundred dollars. Yeah, I think right uh, now it's like hundred, hundred and ten, or something like that. Oh god, it, yeah. uh, that's ridiculous. The face commander was the very powerful Zhuladok Avoid Gorger. Five and a colorless for an Eldrazi. Colorless spells you cast from your hand with mana value seven or greater have Cascade. Cascade. Uh, most valuable reprint in the deck was It That Betrays at $24. It better be. <laughs> <laughs> this was an expensive deck. Yeah. Uh, the most played new card was Rise of the Eldrazi, only in 10,000 decks on EDA Trek. Uh, pretty good for a 12-mana sorcery. Yeah. <laughs> Nine colorless, colorless, colorless. <laughs> this spell can't be countered. Yeah. I hope so. <laughs> yeah, you're right. Uh, <laughs> <That's fine. laughs> destroy target permanent. Take uh, Destroy target permanent. Target player draws four cards. Take an extra turn after this one. One, exile this card and do the hokey pokey turn yourself around so. absolutely do yeah. it all every single titan um colorless pre-con first of its kind what do we think so uh i actually give this one an a yep. uh i have a lot of respect for the fact that they actually did a colorless pre-con yeah. Yeah. Uh, they've never done that before so extremely unique colors players rejoice uh, i know ashlyn was thrilled yeah yeah um, drowsy players like have something that they can call their own and also Zulodox sick yeah and i i have i've had fun every time i've played with this deck every time i played against it it's done something um the other thing I, I really love and respect about this deck this didn't have the tapped land problem that all the other ones did like all the other ones was like all oh, my lands enter tapped this one was like they're all colorless so they can enter untapped yeah mm -hmm. and they gave a ton of utility in your land and your mana base so that was really cool and so for me uh it's an a it's fun yep murph yeah, B for me. Uh, you're right. It is pretty fun. There's a lot of cool cards. Like I love Rise of the Eldrazi. Like yes. this is what oh. I this is what I want in my big splashy card. It is not going to win me the game. It's not like taking two extra turns. It's just going to take one extra turn mm. yeah. and blow something up and give me some more gas. And it can't be countered. Yeah, and it can't be countered. Uh, yeah. But my biggest problem with it was that this deck has a bajillion five and six mana cards, specifically so six mana cards. Yeah. It scares about seven, seven mana cards, <laughs> which yeah. feels to me like the way that it was built they were like yeah Zulodok's just a little bit too good like it gets triggered too often let's pull back on the amount of expensive stuff mm -hmm. but it just creates such a feel bad when you're like i play my commander and now i can't do anything with it yeah mm. great 
The deck cool. also had like five X spells in it. Yeah, yeah they're just it duds. If you hit cas- if you hit them off cascade, yeah, what are the backup commander? <laughs> was it was an X? Was an X? Was an X. Yeah. And so I'm like, I don't know. I, I have this deck, and I'm always a little hit or miss with it, mm. which is why I gave it a B. It's fun, but can have some feel bad. When you hit, it's great. Uh, B for me as well. Uh, again, super weird uh, design problems in the deck, probably related to power. Like you mentioned, there were just concerned yeah. that this deck was going to be too good in the pods. Don't make the commander so um, good then. But then, Problem yeah, solved. then nerf the commander. Problem solved. Yeah. <laughs> You're designing it. <laughs> you can you have the power. Uh, yeah, I, I, the value was just too bad on this one. And uh, for it to have the design problems that it had coming out of the gate, I, I did couldn't give this one an A, but super cool. I love that it was a colorless precon, and it did have a lot of the colorless cards we really wanted to see reprinted. And lots yeah. of cool new yeah. colorless cards, too. It did. Yeah. Uh, I What I really like about Commander Masters overall, <laughs> you can clip that. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's your new meme. Uh, is, is that they took typically like really powerful commander mechanics Mm -hmm. or uh, commander archetypes and they tried to make like casual versions of them right where they like colorless tends to be like artifact combo and they were like all right we'll make it kind of a value cascadey deck yeah Uh, and this next one was enchantments which they did kind of a different thing with enchantments um enduring enchantments decks was the next abzan deck of the year green white black uh the bang for your buck for this deck was one dollar and 63 cents of reprint value for every one dollar spent Ooh, the worst of the year yep it's just it for the amount that they were charging for these decks it, it didn't yeah, have the does not make sense it no. just didn't get there uh the average price per reprint was one dollar and 84 cents which is also below average and unacceptable for a deck of its price uh that being said the face commander was very popular. Mm-hmm. It was Anicthia, Hand of Erebos. Two white, black, green for a 4-4 demigod with menace. Other enchantment creatures you control have menace. When Anicthia enters the battlefield or attacks, exile up to one target non-aura enchantment card from your graveyard. Make a token that's a copy of that card, except it's a 3-3 black zombie creature in addition to its other types. It's like um, Enchantress Reanimator. Yeah, it's really neat. Uh, most expensive reprint of the deck was Dryad of the Elysian Grove at sitting at twenty dollars. How's this twenty dollars? <laughs> it's re- it's that, yeah. really powerful. It is. Um, yeah. uh, the most played new card was Undo Spirit Dancer, which is only in nine thousand decks on EDA Trek. This is the one that whenever an enchantment enters the battlefield under your control, you make a token copy that's a copy of it. Only do it once each turn. Very powerful. Yeah, Very really powerful, powerful card yeah. on a five mana uh, creature. Okay. Um, Let's just go straight into grades. Dan? Uh, I give it a C. Yeah. Um, it's fine. I, I will admit there's a bit of bias there. I am a, not a huge fan of Enchantress decks. I think it's a very overdone thing. Mm-hmm. Don't get me wrong. This one did it a little bit differently than some of the Enchantress decks of the past. But at the end of the day, it is just an Enchantress deck. And I didn't love that. And the and with that, if you're taking out the parts and using it other things, it's like, okay, this goes in Enchantress deck and that's it. Mm-hmm. Um, and the other thing is this one had the Tainted Lands and only like five swamps in it. So you just had two, a bunch of colorless duels. So that was great. Perfect. Um, Thank you, guys. So it, it had the mana issues that like all of these decks except for the colorless one had. And so for me, it's a C. It's whatever. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And the price and the reprint value just, it really, it really kills it for me. Yep. Yeah, Murph. Good points. Uh, I, I gave it a B. Uh, I, I think it's a little bit better than that. Uh, it's three colors, so the mana base usually works out. It's okay. Uh, but yeah, Anicthia, cool new card, uh, more interesting version of Enchantress, having it be black, green, and white. Uh, the Obzon color combination I thought was interesting because that's not really something that we really see mm-hmm. from uh uh, Enchantress style types of decks. Sure. So I don't know. I, I didn't think it was quite as bad as you make it out to be. Yeah. I, I hated it. So a B. Uh, I'm looking at my grade right now, and I'm actually also going to say a B. I'm going to lower my grade a little bit. Um, I was really high on this deck when I first looked at the list. Mm-hmm. Uh, we didn't know any of the prices off the bat. We just had list. Yeah. And it has all the pieces that you put in an Enchantress deck. Yep. Yeah. It's just it's just a functional like what I would build if I was building my own deck. And that is always really impressive to me in a precon where it's just like if I if I was gonna build this deck, I would have thirty of these cards in here already. Yeah. Which is good. Um which I was very I was very impressed by and I liked a lot of the new cards. They had some very powerful new um enchantment cards that were mm-hmm. in this deck. Yep. Um plus it offers that sort of reanimator 
thing, which was cool and it's different. And different. Yeah. A lot of uh, Enchantress archetypes are like Stormy. It's like cast, yeah. cast an enchantment, draw cast two draw, cards. Cast, cast an draw, enchantment, cast draw two cards. Yeah, to keep your hand. Full. Um, and this gave you sort of a different version and turned your enchantments into creatures, so you had some punching power. Uh, so I liked a lot about it, but again, the the price was just unacceptable for this deck. Uh, if this was a forty dollar deck. Oh my god! Pretty good. Yeah, I would give it a higher grade. It if would be it awesome. were cheaper. Like, but, uh, it, but it, it just didn't get there with the price on the shelf. For so, what's worth, I think this is the best of the Commander Masters precons. I agree. I thought it was really synergistic. It played really well. Um, I, I liked it a lot out of the box. That being said, I uh, can't give it any higher than a B for that price. Uh, moving on to Planeswalker Party. Ooh, this is my upgrade. We're having a party. Another yeah. just got It's go time. Here we go. Red, white, blue Planeswalker deck. The bang for your buck here was $2.11. Yep, low. The average price per reprint was $2.34. That was good. Good. We like that one. <laughs> the interesting thing about this deck is it ended up being, ended up being the cheapest to buy and yep. had one of the higher reprint values yep. of the group. So it actually was more affordable and did offer a better value than the other ones, in my opinion. I think it's just not as appealing to yes. most commander players the as the other ones. face commander was uh, Commodore Guff. The Commodore. <laughs> One blue, red, white for a legendary planeswalker hyphen Guff. Guff. He comes in with five loyalty. He has an uh, static ability that says at the beginning of your end step, put a loyalty counter on another target planeswalker you control and a plus one that says create a one one red wizard creature token with tap add red spend this only to cast planeswalkers and a minus three that says you draw x cards and commodore guff deals x damage to each opponent where x is the number of planeswalkers you control he can be your commander that's guff <laughs> best reprint of the deck was chain Thanks, at 33 dollars, and the most played new card is only in 5700 decks on eda trek it's guff rewrites history uh, this is basically a polymorph removal spell. I think it's pretty neat. Yep. Uh, you pick uh, four things and th they get shuffled in and you reveal something else. So for you, you pick a little thing. For them, you pick their biggest thing. It's pretty fun. I have seen it go very wrong. Uh, <laughs> very. Yeah. <laughs> so, Govery writes a history. Pretty cool. What was your grade for this one, Damon? Um again biased i gave it a b mm. uh i had a lot of fun upgrading the deck i had a lot of, i have a lot of fun playing the deck this is uh one of the ones i picked up and uh, i love that the commander in and of itself gives you ramp gives you card draw gives you a way to close out the game which mm. is something planeswalker decks struggle with historically mm. and i like that if you wanted to flesh this out and build a planeswalker deck which is a very popular uh deck archetype it gave you a lot of the pieces for it. I really liked that they included the chain veil. I was really, really thrilled about that. Mm -hmm. The reprint value was solid. Um, when I was upgrading the deck, I noticed it has all of the like signets and talismans. So it, it, there was a good chance of getting Commodore a little bit early, which you wanted. Um, and I just have fun every time I play this deck. Um, it is more complicated, which is tough. Mm -hmm. um, but the fact that it was the cheapest and had pretty solid reprint and had a lot of the pieces that you'd want anyways, and staples now for Planeswalker decks that didn't exist before. Mm -hmm. uh, for me, that gave it a B. I, I think it's great. I think that's fair. Murph. Yeah, I gave it a D. Um, my my rule of thumb is if Damon thinks a deck is fun to play, it's probably <laughs> miserable to play against. <laughs> So, <laughs> no, but actually, <laughs> actually, I, I have played against this deck multiple times, and every time it was just a slog. It was miserable to play mm. against because it's kind of a planeswalker deck, and they would do the thing of, all right, I'm going to kill your stuff. Well, nobody can attack the planeswalkers. Uh, or there's like the one, it was a Teo or whatever, where it's like, mm. you can only attack this direction. And, yep. and then they only killed the uh, creatures to the person to their right. Yep. And we're like, we can't do anything. And they slowly, slowly win the game and we just have no way to overcome it. Yeah. yeah. And it had the Vrondis, which phased out planeswalkers and stuff yeah. like that. So, it was yeah. cool. so that, plus, that plus the fact that the, I thought the reprint value would be a little bit higher for something with planeswalkers. Yeah, in quality it. of Planeswalkers was quite yeah. low in the deck. Mm. Which was weird, because like, it's not fun to play against, but also the Planeswalkers that are in it, uh, I, I thought they could have done better. So it's in this weird in-between state now. I, I think it falls in like the XL camp of, sure. it's something different, they tried it, don't think it worked great, but you tried, and I respect that. Yeah. Sure. I was right in the middle with the C. I liked this deck a lot. Uh, the problem with Commodore for me was it just like the sort of the reason why you liked it is it didn't leave any problems to solve. It gave you ramp. It gave it you fun. cards. It gave you a win con <laughs> and it gave you a planeswalker. And then the deck could be full of any number of baby time planeswalkers, yep. which it was. And it would be a perfectly functional planeswalker deck. Um, 
it, and it's because the commander was just so generically strong on yep. its face. Uh, but that being said, it had a lot of new cards that I was really excited about. And the value was actually there here. Like, I think this one was justifiable to buy off the shelf if you had a Planeswalker deck in any of these colors. Yep. Um, so I also like the backup commander a lot that gave you a, sort of a new Planeswalker archetype that hadn't been... Um, it had, it had really, a lot of support. really addressed on on a planeswalker before, yeah. or on a commander before, which yeah. was like if you want to build a deck with all of one kind of planeswalker, mm -hmm. you here's can yeah, here's your commander for yeah. that, and that filled a hole that was existing, and I always appreciate when uh, Wizards recognizes that. Yeah. So a lot of pros for me, but overall, I thought the deck was sort of lackluster, and uh, they could have done a little bit to make it more interesting and different than a typical planeswalker strategy. It, it was a tough one. Yeah. yeah. Uh, final rank for this one is a C. Cool. So that, I think that's actually the highest of... No, no. It's a, a B. The the enchantment one is higher. Oh, we have one more to talk about. I forgot. It's the sliver deck. <laughs> Yay. It's the most expensive. Yay. Five color sliver deck with sliver grave mother in the command zone. Uh, the archetype, of course, was slivers. The bang for your buck was $1.92 <laughs> of reprint Ouch. value. Low. Oh. The average price per reprint was $1.94. Also low. Slivers can get Thank expensive you. too. What, Why? What's going on? <laughs> what have you done? The face commander was Sliver Grave Mother. Wooberg for a 6-6 six, six Sliver. The legend rule doesn't apply to Slivers you control. Uh-oh. <laughs> Each Sliver creature card in your graveyard has Encore X, where X is its mana value. And it has Encore 5. The most valuable reprint was Synapse Sliver, a one that had never been reprinted before and was very powerful at $25.50. Whenever a Sliver deals combat damage to a player, its controller may draw a card. Finally, the most played new card of the deck was Titan of Lit Yara. Doesn't even crack like... 6,000 decks on EDH track. It's a fun card. I like it. It's, it's okay. It's yeah. Okay. It's pretty good. Um, yeah. The the biggest complaint about the Sliver Grave Mother deck was it missed some really big, really yeah. needed Sliver reprints Where like Sliver, Sliver Hive. Hive. Uh, it? And it had an unplayable mana base. Straight up unplayable. Great. Yeah. And to go to the grade, uh, I gave it a D. It's, it's, it sucks because the cards in the deck outside of the lands were pretty good. Mm -hmm. If it had a, a, even a playable mana base, it would have been pretty solid. Mm. The mana base was so bad. Like my girlfriend picked up this deck. She loves slivers and mm. she was super duper excited for it. But when, when every turn is tap land go with an aggro deck, like that, you get punished so hard for it. And so like the, the commander itself is powerful. The slivers in the deck are pretty good, but man, playing it is horrible it's so rough like the first yeah, thing you got to yeah. do is just upgrade this mana base and it's difficult because they clearly know how to build five color mana bases they've had five color uh decks before um and this one just they just whiffed really really hard so uh for me it's it's a d yeah murph uh for me it's an f yep. for very much the same reason of if you if you cannot play magic then the deck gets an f I'm sorry. It doesn't matter how cool the cards in there are. Like you, you just got to be able to play magic. And again, I played multiple times against and with this deck, the sliver decks would put a couple things out that they could play and then do stone cold, nothing past yep. that. Yep. And that's just how the deck plays. And that is an F for me. And also, like you said, missed opportunities with reprints, which could have possibly saved this for me, but as it stands. Yep. Uh, I gave this one a D. I liked that they did a sliver precon. People love slivers. They really want to yeah, play that. It's a good them. idea. And it was really, really popular. But um, the the ticket price was so high and the deck was miserable to play. It's the most disappointing uh, one for me. I, yeah. I played it and like playing that many tap lands just puts you on the back foot immediately and slivers need to be on the front foot. That's the point. Yeah. So if they're a step behind everybody, including the Planeswalker deck they're going to lose. Yep. There's just no chance. Yep. Uh, and that made it just I impossible and, to to give a good grade. And to. you don't need fetch, fetches and shocks to have a good mana base. No. There's a ton of budget lands that they could have gone with, but everything enters tapped. It's like, what's going on? Here's a tapped fetch to get your tapped land. Yeah. yeah. It's you're like, I have to play something. Yeah. Or to you're play. just missing colors or whatever yeah. Yeah. it might be. Like, oh, we're into that a ton. Yeah. Brutal. Uh, overall, the Sliver Grave Mother gets a D from the command zone. Brutal. Not good. Not so good. All right, moving on to Wilds of Eldraine. We're getting wild. We are. We're going to start with the fairy precon, Fey Dominion. I did this one. Yeah, Damon did this one. <laughs> uh, it's blue and black. It's fairy themed. It's bang for your buck was $2.69 of reprint values. Pretty good, above average. The average price per reprint was $1.79. A little low for the average uh, 
card quality of the year. The face commander was Tegwell, Duke of Splendor. This is one blue black for a 2-3 fairy noble with flying and death touch. Other fairies you control get plus one plus one. And whenever another fairy you control dies, you draw a card and lose one life. Uh, most valuable reprint in the deck was Kindred Dominance at $22. Uh, Kindred Dominance at the time is actually a little bit lower than that it because of the way that recording and prices worked it was really high when we started recording this episode yep. um but it had been reprinted in commander masters oh, so kindred I dominance was actually a, a little bit worse of a reprint than 22 dollars mm -hmm. but that that was what we recorded it reported it at the time the most played new card is misleading signpost in only 4200 decks such a cool card it is really neat it's a portal mage when it enters the battlefield during the declare attacker step you may reselect which player or permanent target attacking creature is attacking and it adds blue it's a flash mana rock that can be like you attack my battle ha ha yeah. Yeah, now for these more recent ones, the most played new card is a little bit misleading. See what I did there? <laughs> uh, because it's only played in 4,000 decks, but also this deck came out uh, yeah, like, like three months ago. Not yeah, even three very months. Recently. Two months ago, yeah. Two months ago? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, God. Yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> so so it's, it's, it is hard to gauge. We, don't, we haven't right. had enough time to really figure out what's going to be like the staples from this right. deck. So the, these numbers you have to sort of take with a grain of salt. For uh, about this one forward. Yeah. yeah for that, I would I would agree. Damon, But rank. that being said, my rank, uh, I give this one an S. This mm -hmm. deck felt amazing out of the box. I loved that both of the commanders, the face commander at Tegwell, the backup commander at Alela, were two very powerful decks that you could tailor the entire deck around mm -hmm. like you i i could make the direct straw from tegwell to elayla and still have a blast playing the deck straight out of the box and i could keep it with tegwell and still have a blast playing out of the mm -hmm. box if i wanted to upgrade it i could go in either direction and they could go in each other's decks and so it just felt really really good the the reprints felt solid um i love the misleading signpost and there were staples for other decks like i picked up a ton of the uh the fairy puppeteers mm -hmm. because like really good. for any uh deck where you're playing a bunch of flyers it acts as like a blue crater hoof yeah. Well, you slam it blue down and now... Blue doesn't have. Yeah, yeah, which blue doesn't have. So now you're attacking with these four fours that with all of your one one tokens or whatever. It feels really, really good. It has Defense ward, games, it has yeah. an ETB where it creates two fairies for you. So that's been a staple and I've picked up a bunch of them for other decks. Yeah. Um, so this deck, I have no complaints about. Solid S for me. Yeah. Murph? I would agree. Solid S. This deck is great. It's blue, black fairies. Uh, it's a cool archetype. We love it. Uh, like you said, the commanders uh, just kind of play off of each other. You could go one direction uh, or the other direction mm -hmm. if you're trying to upgrade it a little bit, but they're not too far apart that they feel bad to be played together. Yeah. So, yeah, I like it. Reprints are pretty solid. Mm -hmm. Bank your Buck's pretty solid. Yep. Solid S. I gave this one an S as well. Ooh. S's across the board. Uh, yeah, this was the perfect pre-con to be like, here, I got you a deck. Now you can play. Yep. And it has the kind of thing where people really like fairies or really like control. It's something, it's very grabby and it, there's a lot of ways that you could upgrade it. Um, I was drawn to both commanders, which is really interesting. Mm -hmm. I think the only complaint that could be maybe uh, lobbed at this deck was it doesn't have a lot of sack outlets for a commander that says dies, but that was it. It was yep. really, really playable out of the box and a ton of fun. Great job, Wizards. Yeah. Well, and it was cool because we really didn't have a fairy commander before that. Yeah, like, like a, a really dedicated good, one. Yeah. yeah, I agree. Uh, the next one is Virtue and Valor. This is a green, white rolls deck slash auras. Uh, the bang for your buck here was $2.96, well above average. And the average price per reprint was $2. So about the the quality of cards throughout the year. The face commander was Elevere of the Wild Court. Two green, white for a human knight. She's a 4-4. When she enters the battlefield or attacks, make a virtuous roll token attached to another target creature you control. Uh, virtuous rolls, of course, give plus one, plus one for each enchantment you control. It's so uh, she's the only one that, that gives virtuous rolls, and they're really good. <laughs> yeah. Uh, whenever an enchanted creature you control deals combat damage to a player, draw a card. Really a very strong effect. Uh, the most valuable reprint was Hall of Heliod's Generosity at 13 bucks. Uh, pretty good. Very yep. powerful land. I, I always like when they include lands in these. The most played new card is Songbird's Blessing in 5,600 decks in EDA Trek. This is a four-man aura uh, that says whenever an enchanted creature attacks, reveal cards from the top of your library until you reveal an aura card. You may put that card onto the battlefield. If you don't, put it into your hand. Put the rest on the bottom of your library in a random order. It's like disgusting. Yeah, it is like Discover. 
Yes. Put it into your hand. Discover I see auras. Weird. See, they were hinting. They were. They were doing a wink. <laughs> uh, all right, Damon, ra- grades. Uh, I give this one a B. Mm-hmm. Um, I mentioned earlier how I really don't like Enchantress decks, but this one I actually really enjoyed. Yeah. Um, it solves one of the issues that I have with enchantment decks, which is like, they just sit there and just sort of build a board and just keep drawing cards. And they aren't doing anything. Yeah. This one said, I'm going to make your creatures really, really big. And I'm going to, pay you off for hitting people and actually mm-hmm. closing out this game, which was a big complaint that I had with the Anikthia earlier, where it's like, sure, you're reanimating these creatures, but you don't actually have a major incentive to attack. Mm. You could still do just the defensive thing, which I saw with uh, at least the decks that I played against, where it's like, okay, well, you're just making 3-3 blockers every turn. Mm-hmm. But this one Joe. was like, <laughs> yeah. where this one was like, I, you're going to be aggressive, and I'm going to pay you off for it while still doing the Enchantress thing, which is very powerful. So for me, if I was building Enchantress deck, it would be this one currently. And so it's a B. Um, I'm not going to give it a day because it still is Enchantress, still is a little bit boring, mm-hmm. but at the very least, I can respect it did it a little bit differently and rolls were really cool. I agree. Stop taking my points, Damon. Yeah, basically <laughs> exactly that. Uh, I gave this one an A though because yeah. I really just do not have that many complaints about it. Like mm-hmm. the reprints, good. Bank yep. for your bucks, good. Uh, a lot of the cards in here are pretty cool. It gives us a lot of extra new toys for enchantments slash auras type decks. Yeah. So yeah, overall, solid A. Yeah, I I gave this one a B uh, as well. And it was mostly because, like, I love this deck. I thought Gilwyn was awesome. And it was the first Enchantress deck that I was... Gilwyn's backup. Um, So good. That was the first Enchantress deck that I was like, I want to build that. I want to figure out what that deck does. Yeah. Um, Because, again... (laughs) Crazy things, as it turns out. Really (laughs) cool things. Really cool things. Um, But the new cards in this deck weren't very good. And I don't think they're going to have a large impact on the format overall. Sure. They were, most of them were auras and most of them were, weren't very good auras. I thought they were neat. They, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. there's some cool cards. They're just, I, I felt like those reprints, it, new cards compared to the new cards in Tegwell were just significantly lower That's power. Fair. And, and that it's is not fair. just because they're auras. It's yeah. because they were like overcosted and just, they just didn't do as much. Uh, So that was a little frustrating. But that being said, this is the one I bought. I didn't buy the fairy one Um, because it's a ton of fun. It's got a lot of personality and uh, I'm still working on building a Tegwell deck of my own. Both Wilds of Eldrain decks, awesome. Yeah, they they nailed it with the Wilds of Eldrain. It's awesome. Final rank for the Virtue and Valor deck is B overall. All right. We have two more sets of pre-cons. Yeah, I believe for the year, we are going to get to them after a few words from our sponsors. We'll be right back. Josh, this is an intervention. Can it wait? I have all these resumes I got to read. We miss you, man. The old you, before you spent every waking moment browsing job sites. I can't help it. I got to hire people so that the work can get done. The work needs you, Josh. So you need Indeed, the website where you can attract, interview, and hire all in one place. Their hiring platform does the hard work for you, finding candidates quickly with powerful tools like Instant Match. But how do I know they're qualified? With Indeed, you only pay for applications that meet your must-have requirements. So instead of spending hours on multiple job sites, you can spend hours drawing cards or making deals. Hmm, I do like drawing cards. Okay, that does it. I'm using Indeed today. Yeah! Woo! Yeah! Yeah! <laughs> no, okay. Start hiring now with a $75 sponsored job credit to upgrade your job post at Indeed.com slash Command Zone. Offer good for a limited time. Claim your $75 credit now at Indeed.com slash Command Zone. Just go to Indeed.com slash Command Zone and support the show by saying you heard about it on this podcast. Indeed.com slash Command Zone. Terms and conditions apply. Need to hire? You need Indeed. All right, my new deck list is complete. Now, let's see which cards I don't already own and buy them. Wait. How'd you do that without going through a million boxes? Oh, I just use Architect. They make it super easy to upload and manage your collection. Then when you're done brewing a deck, you can sort it by collection status to see what you already have. So this group is just cards you don't own? Yep, I just click buy this stack and it takes me right to Card Kingdom. Whoa. Architect is the best place to browse, brew, and playtest commander decks. Just go to architect.com slash command zone to get started. That's A-R-C-H-I-D-E-K-T dot com slash command zone. Whoa. That flew pretty all right. Welcome I'm going to be behind. Oh. Everybody. <laughs> <laughs> we got to start with the paper airplane. Yeah, I thought that's right. what we were doing. I'm yeah. going to be editing this like, ah, oh, no, the airplane. <laughs> <laughs> all right. We are going to get right into it. We're talking about the Doctor Who pre-con starting with Blast from the Past. Ooh. This is a green, blue, white historic deck uh, about all of the doctors for the first eight, I believe. The bang for your buck value 
in this one was one dollar and seventy four cents. That's pretty low, it's, it's um, especially for decks that were a little bit more expensive off yeah. the shelf. Mm-hmm. The average price per reprint was two dollars and eighteen cents, so a little above average. And that disparity is because there are so many new mechanical cards. So uh, this has the same Lord of the Rings problem, where the bang for your buck values look lower than they actually are because there's so many there's new just cards. There's tons of new cards. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the face commander of this deck was the fourth Doctor that allowed you to play historic spells off the top of your library when you do make food. Sure. <laughs> and the companion that went with him is Sarah Jane Smith. Whenever you cast a historic spell, investigate. Triggers only once. So it's historic matters. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the most played new card is City of Death. Uh, that is outside of Sonic Screwdriver and the TARDIS. Uh, those are in all of these decks, so I didn't count them individually. Because then they'll just like kind of pop up every <laughs> yeah, that, that, And here's the like, TARDIS. It's like, of course. And here's the TARDIS. Uh, yeah. um, <laughs> so that, oh, and the most valuable reprint, excuse me, was Heroic Intervention, this time at $14. Nice. Because of the reprint earlier, it had come down. I'm happy they keep reprinting it. Just keep, keep doing yeah, it. Yeah, in a new skin, again, if you want to build a Doctor Who deck, you want to build it with as many Doctor Who cards as possible. They yeah. have to give you playable cards with this art for your deck to feel as cool as possible. Well, uh, <laughs> they should have done that. Yeah, they yeah. They should have given us playable cards then. Yeah. Uh, okay. So going straight into yeah, our say, rankings, yeah. <laughs> I gave this one an F. Yeah. All of the Doctor Who decks are rough out of the box. Yes. They don't have a really good strategy that they're focusing in on. They have all these pieces because they, they really chose flavor over function. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's hard to play. Like I picked up all of these pre-cons and I'm like, Ah, oh, this is rough. I yep. just feel like I'm not doing anything. The game is a slog. It's just not ending. Mm-hmm. I'm not, I don't feel like I'm really having an impact on this game. And so for me, this one just F. As a caveat, both Damon and Murph are Doctor Who fans. We like Doctor I am. Who. Yeah. I am a Doctor uh, Who fan. I love Doctor Who. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it is, it was, these decks were so disappointing, especially after the Lord of the Rings decks, which were so playable Knocked and powerful and fun out of the box. Doctor Who felt complicated and wheel spinny and like while every card that you looked at individually you were like neat whoa what are we doing yeah the decks as a whole were sloppy and yeah. felt tough to play against each and other i'm sure there was a very clear design choice from the yeah. designers of hey we have this opportunity to make all these doctor who cards yeah do we want to focus on making good and cool top down designs mm-hmm. or focus on making more cohesive decks and they chose the former and that's fine but when it comes to the decks in and of themselves that means they're not very good and, that, and that's yeah. exactly right as a doctor who fan the cards are cool yes i love seeing great. all the references and seeing it i was like yes they nailed it that is 100 percent flavorful that's how that would mm-hmm. be designed as a magic player, they are not good. They are very rough, and I did not have a good time playing. <laughs> They're not good together. They is what I would guns. say. Yeah. yeah, yeah. The cards themselves, when you take them out, there yeah. are pieces for other decks. That yeah. is a good point. Yeah. yeah, and that was a big reason why I still went ahead and picked these up, even though I didn't have a good time playing them out of the box. I took them apart for parts, and Individual those parts, cards and joy. those carts were able to go into other decks of mine. That is a very good point and very important. Yeah, but out of the box, I just can't give it a, a very good grade. Yeah, I Mark, mean, that, what was your grade? That's why I gave it a D mm. because it does have some stuff that you can use. Uh, I do think that this particular one is the weakest. Yeah. of the Doctor Who decks because it just the the face commander is bad. Fourth Doctor is just not very good. Yeah. Yeah. And it doesn't inherently want to do something. It wants to make food, play artifacts. It it, it just kind of pulls all over the place generally? and doesn't really like close games out or end games. It spins its wheels in pursuit of nothing. Yeah. yeah. From what I've experienced. I, I I felt the same. Uh, I gave this one. I gave this one a D, and it, this is the only one I picked up. Um, I thought there were some <laughs> really. I thought that these were some really neat cards in this yes. deck. Like individually, this had Nissa of Traken, which I think is an awesome. This is card. one of the few yeah. cards that's like, like, oh, I can actually start closing yeah. things out. This had and City of Death. Going. Like yeah. City of Death is a very yeah. cool card. It displays dinosaurs. These are <laughs> the dinosaur, like yeah. I love the dinosaurs. Yeah. Like there was a ton of individual cards that were really cool, but like you look at those cards and sort of zoom out, and you're like. But then this also had like a vehicle that made one thing unblockable yep. and a saga that makes like a girl and a rhino and then you tutor for a doctor and it is not cohesive it, except no. for the art. It's, That's it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, as somebody who who isn't as familiar with Doctor Who, although I did have watched some to get a context for this set, I found a lot of the cards were mechanically interesting, but the decks were incredibly frustrating to actually um, to 
move the game along. They yeah. felt very low power. Yeah. It, it was neat that if you have a lot of decks, you probably have pieces in this deck for those decks yeah. because of how wide a net it casts. For sure. So yeah, there's that. I, guess. Um, I gave this one as a precon a D, yep. uh, which means overall it is a D. Yep. All right, moving on to the second Grixis baddie deck of yeah, the year. Baddies. It's masters the Masters of Evil. Of evil. evil, 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 evil. <laughs> this is a blue, red, black precon uh, themed around artifact creatures, sort of generally, but more around removal spells. Yeah. Um, the bang for your buck here was $2.33, a little low, but to be expected, the average price per reprint was $2.77, which was pretty high average. The face commander was Davros, Dalek Creator. Dalek. Uh, four mana, three, four with menace. At the beginning of your end step, create a three, three black Dalek artifact creature token with menace. If an opponent lost three or more life this turn, then each opponent who lost three or more life this turn faces a villainous <laughs> choice. You draw a card or that player <laughs> discards a card. The uh, most valuable reprint was Storm Carved Coast at $17. A good land. Thank you. The most played new card was Cyberman Squadron. at. It's only in 3,000 decks, but it just came out. This is the one that gives your non-legendary artifact creatures myriad. Pretty yeah. cool pretty good this one was the most playable out of the box yeah so this one i gave a c because i actually when i when i played this one i had a really good time i felt like i was uh moving the game in a direction of finishing it mm -hmm. i was doing powerful things the the face commander was cool where it's like it is not too hard for me to deal that three damage because all of your creatures have menace all the daleks and whatnot and so uh you got that choice the villainous choice and you're either drawing a bunch of cards or having them dis having your opponents discard so i was getting card advantage and i was moving the game towards a conclusion, mm -hmm. which I really liked. Um, on top of that, for me personally, this one had the most pieces that I ended up taking and putting into other places. I love the uh, Weeping Angels card, the yeah, flash removal spell. Yeah. Um, and I've picked up a bunch of them for a bunch of other decks. Um, so, oh, and one other thing that the Seacrum Curse reminded me, all of these decks have really solid mana bases really and good really bases. good staple lands, which I really, really, really liked. Which would really have been good with art. the Sliver deck. Yeah, yeah it would have yeah. been second yeah. Sliver deck. You can do it. Um, um, yeah, there's so, a Waterlog Grove in this that's like gorgeous. Yeah, yeah, yeah 100%. Um, Not in this one. In, 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 in yeah. the other one, yeah. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, they had great mana bases, which I, I loved and I really, really appreciated. Um, so for me, it's a C. It's fine. Um, I didn't love it. I didn't hate it. It's whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, basically uh, the same type of thing. Like Davros encourages you to be attacking and to be dealing damage mm -hmm. to people. And so I really appreciate that about the deck. It's the one that causes the most action. It does things. Like you said, it has the most pieces that I think are interesting and cool and go on other things. Like I'm putting together a cyber controller deck cool. list on Architects cyber right now. And I'm like, really this is super sweet. I love this. And there's like all these Cybermen and Daleks that go in there. So I think that overall it's the best of them. That being said, it is still pretty clunky yeah um so uh, as a result i gave it a c i gave this one a c as well or cybermen um uh, this one was the most cohesive both the like cybermen and the dalek synergies worked together yeah which was great like they were going in two different directions but at least they lived, they're artifact they, creatures. they like they're yeah. artifact creatures they live together yeah um so that was really really good um, and this one had a lot of legendary creatures that were very interesting to me yeah. as like mechanically interesting commanders. The master, yeah. the master's uh, sick. The master's really cool. Like there's a number of masters, but the, the cyber too. controller, mm -hmm. uh, Missy's really interesting. Then there's the the casualty one that I yeah. don't know his name is, is in this one as well. So there's a lot of cool pieces in this deck, but again, it felt a little expensive. The deck had way too much control in it. It made yeah. like way too much control. A lot of targeted removal. And it just made the other precons like couldn't do anything most of the time. Yeah, just put them <laughs> and they barely do anything as is. Yeah. yeah. So uh, this one I gave a C. It, it probably could have a B, honestly. But overall, we're going to give this one a C. All right, moving on to the Teamer deck. It is Paradox Power with the 13th Doctor and Yas Yasmin Khan. It's red, green, blue. Uh, the archetype was like casting from not your hand. Yep. And also plus one counters. The bang for your buck here was $1.89. Pretty low, like the others. The average price per reprint was $2.48. So quite good quality of reprints, which again, we are happy to see. And is I think all of these like high quality numbers that we're getting is because mm -hmm. the mana base is so strong. It's quite good. So the face commander is the 13th doctor. Whenever you cast a spell from anywhere other than your hand, put a counter on target creature. At the beginning of your end step, untap each creature you control with a counter on it. And Yasmin Khan taps to let you cast something from exile 
perfect. You put a counter, she taps, you draw two cards a turn. The most valuable reprint was, again, Stormcarve Coast at $17. Sure. Is it represent? And the most played new card was Quantum Misalignment. Uh, this is a five-mana clone with rebound create a token that's a copy of target creature you control except it isn't legendary it's that's the part that makes yeah, that's, it good yes. that's the part that makes it the good. fact that you can this, copy this card's quite powerful yeah it's, it's five mana but it's worth it uh because you get two of them as long as you, you can know, get two of your it's commanders? got rebound yeah it's got rebound yeah so you end up no, with three total <laughs> yeah, 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 it's yeah. Really <laughs> you get two of your commanders for the low low price of five mana it's mm-hmm. pretty good that's very or two more mm-hmm. <laughs> on top of the original one with the rebound yeah cool uh, uh, great. In terms of grade, I'm actually, I, I originally gave it an F. I'm actually going to change mine to a D. Mm-hmm. And the reason is I'm reading through the commander again and I'm realizing as I'm building more decks, I keep finding places to put her. And I really, really like that. Mm. Um, so She's only three mana. Yeah, she's yeah. only three mana. She synergizes with the casting things from anywhere, which they keep leaning into. Mm-hmm. And then the untap with the counter thing is pretty good. Um, and so... I, like I, as I've been building decks since this released, uh, I've noticed that I keep being like, "Oh, I can just slot this in. This feels good." Um, so for me, I didn't have a ton of fun playing it out of the box. It's it's definitely struggled with what we talked about, where it didn't have a lot of focus for me, and. I, I, I didn't really like it out of the box, but the fact that uh, this deck also had a lot of pieces that I can move into other places, and I actually really do enjoy the face commander conceptually, mm-hmm. um, I think I'm going to give it a D, because um, for me, that is a, a something that I could see myself building around someday, or, like I said, just putting it somewhere else. We yeah. keep getting that effect. So, D. Yeah. Yep. Welcome to the D Club. I also gave it a D mm-hmm. um, for similar reasons I, I think overall the deck is not great uh but at least it has the one one counterpart mm-hmm. an aspect of it so mm-hmm. it's making something that could potentially be a game ending threats yeah. yeah so it is working towards something and it says hey cascade play cards from exile play Adventure. cards from out your hand uh, anything like that yeah. uh that there is like room for there to be more stuff that can go in there and there's enough stuff in the initial deck that it's not awful yeah yeah I, I gave this one a D as well. I think it had a lot of the problems of the other uh, Doctor Who decks, mostly being like super high curve. Um, but this one gave you uh, it gave you an offense, it gave you a defense, and it gave you card advantage, yeah. and it made it feel like a more purposeful package mm-hmm. with the thirteenth com- uh, the thirteenth Doctor, excuse me, and Yasmin Khan in the command zone. Yeah. Uh, overall, we're gonna give this one a D as well. D for Damon. Yep. The tenth Doctor, the timey wimey deck. It's ten. Rachel times. just likes saying time. Time to warm <laughs> I'm on board. Uh, this is another Jeskai deck. Blue, white, red. I heard you like Jeskai. Uh, <laughs> the archetype this time was time counters generally. Uh, phasing, suspend. Uh, phasing? Yeah. Vanishing. 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 Yeah. Vanishing. Uh, Close. Su- suspend and um, like even cumulative upkeep type of stuff. Uh, the bang for your buck here was $2.85, uh, like pretty strong. And the average price per reprint was $3.75, uh, Wait. which makes it the best of the year. Very good. Yeah. At its pre-order price. <laughs> yeah. That's the problem. It's because, way more expensive. Yeah. Because now. this one was the most beloved of all the Doctor Who sets. It has the ninth Doctor, the 10th mm-hmm. Doctor, and the 11th Doctor, yep. which yep. people tend to have the most nostalgia for. Those are the Doctors. That that's pe- the one that people like. That's the one they're going to pick up. 100%. Mm-hmm. So it, this $3.75 was amazing at time of, of recording, and we were really happy to see that. But yeah, this is the one that was most expensive off the shelf by a long shot. Yeah. And that's if you could find it on the shelf at all. It's it's hard to find. Um, it's very hard to find. Yeah. The Tenth Doctor d- says some stuff. <laughs> Three blue red for a Time Lord Doctor is a 3-5. When you attack, exile cards from the top of your library until you exile a non-land card. Put three time counters on it. If it doesn't have suspend, it gains suspend. Then, seven colon. Time travel three times. Activate only as a sorcery. Uh, Time travel, you can add a time counter or remove a time counter from any number of permanents you have or things you have with time counters on it. It doesn't have to be permanents. Uh, the 10th Doctor goes with Rose Tyler, of course. Of course. One in a white for a 2-2 human. Ty- Rose Tyler gets plus one, plus one for each time counter on it. Whenever she attacks, put a time counter on it for each suspend counter you own and each other permanent you control with a time <laughs> counter on it. I, I misread could, this card. Could be plus one, plus so one counters. Bad, yeah. So bad. But it's not... Uh, it's time counters, so she works with the tenth doctor, so he makes her bigger. I suppose the most valuable reprint was Sunbaked Canyon at twenty one dollars, and the most played new card was Everybody, Everybody Lives. 
Rose. <laughs> Justice wants <laughs> Rose. Everybody lives. It's such, it's such a good episode, too. So it, good. Yeah. It's a really sweet card. Uh, one and a white for an instant. All creatures gain hexproof and indestructible until end of turn. Players gain hexproof until end of turn. Players can't lose the li- life this turn. And players can't lose the game or win the game this turn. Yeah. Uh, neat card. Hard to evaluate overall. What'd you give this one, Damon? Uh, I get this one. <laughs> not, not this card. No, yeah. The deck. Uh, yeah, the deck. <laughs> the, the deck. Uh, Everybody Lives is pretty good, but the deck, <laughs> I gave it a D. Um, it's, again, fine for the Doctor Who decks. It's still suffered with the unfocused thing. The fact that you're playing a five drop commander, and then you're like, now nah, I'm going to pay seven, and I had to have already done a bunch of other things to make it good mm-hmm. was rough. Um, and the fact that Rose Tyler, like, she wanted you to have a lot of counters on things, but then. Uh, the, your face commander wanted you to not have as many most of the time. Yeah, like removed counters Count- from yeah, all your Yeah, so like stuff. that didn't feel super great. Love the Horizon Land include. Again, the mana base is solid. Yeah. Um, so it's it's fine. It's a D. I think this was another huge missed opportunity mm. because like Wizards knows that this is the deck that people are going to want to pick up. So instead of making it a little on the simpler side, try to get in new players, they went and made the most complicated pre-con deck I have ever played. It's very oh complicated. It's, it's ridiculously rough. complicated. You have all of these time counters that you are removing from things that are suspended in exile, these vanishing things. There's sagas in there that you have to keep track of. But those, those aren't time those counters. Those aren't time counters. Those there's, are lore counters. There's some plus one plus one counters, which also aren't time counters. Nope. And Rose Tyler only gets buffed by time counters. But and, you have other dice. And you have other dice, and she doesn't actually have plus one plus one counters put on her. And it's ridiculously complicated for, I don't think, a very good reason. No. Yeah, I I think this is like a mechanically intriguing box of magic cards. Yeah. There's a lot of cards in them that you're like, oh, neat, okay. Um, but when I played this played this deck, it was fighting itself every single step of the way. I remember in the game nights episode, you were sitting there just like, it, if I if I do this, oh, but I can't do that. Like, can I do this? And you're just like trying to figure out like how to make the deck work. Everything and, like, was just trying so to grab it and expensive. It. There were yeah. so many like four mana three twos that yeah. have to deal combat damage yep. and they have no evasion. And you're like, wow. <laughs> yeah, I like, guess the Daleks, what am I supposed to do? My there? commander doesn't help with that. It also yeah. doesn't have time counters. And like, if Rose dies, you're like, I have no win con. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Like it, Rose was the only, the deck's only plan to win the game. And she is a single point of removal yeah. and doesn't have evasion. Or protection. Um, or protection or anything other than sort of being big. Um, <laughs> I, it was a really frustrating deck to play because it was just like, yeah. there were cool cards in it, but to do anything cool, you needed like 15 mana. And even that cool thing didn't win you the game. It just like gave you sort of incremental value. Yeah. Uh, overall, I gave this one a D, which means that the command zone also gives this a D. Oh yeah, I, I was a D. I don't think I said that. Yeah. yeah. So uh, not, a, not a total failure, but not not very good. It was cool. Like if we're talking rule of cool, this one was the neatest deck. Yeah. And then you had it in your hands and you You're were like, just like, what do I do? How yeah. am I supposed to, this says on my upkeep, I add a counter and then I maybe draw a card. They went too far <laughs> you had to put on the little tax visor and you're like all right what are all yeah. my counters today and then it, it was a little meanwhile too... half of your stuff is just vanishing yeah. you're like i paid for man don't leave please, yeah, please there's a little too designer happy <laughs> yeah. complexity does not automatically equal a good gaming experience cool exactly. but so difficult yeah all right, we're going to move on to the final set of precons for the year. This is the Lost Caverns of Ixalan. There are four uh, typal decks. We're going to start with Pirates with Ahoy Mates, the final Grixis deck of the year. Blue, black, red Pirates deck. The bang for your buck here was a whopping three dollars and 64 cents pretty good that's good print value for every like it one dollar like a full one dollar higher than the average yeah yep. the average price per reprint was one dollar and 97 cents so about average um again that that means there's some big reprints in the deck yep uh, the face commander was Admiral Brass Unsinkable. She's Cannot a five mana human pirate. When she enters the battlefield, mill four cards at the beginning of combat on your turn. You may return target pirate creature card from your graveyard to the battlefield with a finality counter on it. It has base power and toughness 4-4 four, four, and it gains haste. The best reprint of the deck was Black Market Connections at $26.24. We oh, salute so. you with some new art on it. Thank you. And the most played new card, again, these just came out. Uh, it's really hard to say if this is going to be the card forever. It is the Indomitable. This is a four mana blue vehicle with trample. Whenever a creature you control deals combat damage to a player, draw a card. It's a 6-6 six, six. with crew three. You may cast the Indomitable from your graveyard as long as you control three or more tapped pirates 
parts and or vehicles. This card's sweet. Yeah. Okay. So this is really great reprint value. Um, as spoiler alert, all of the Lost Caverns decks are. If they um, watched our uh, previous videos, they already know that. Yeah, I they already know that really good. This set single-handedly made Wilds of El- made Wilds of Eldraine look like nothing. Yeah, which is crazy because Wilds was great. Was great. Yeah. And then we were this so happy with it. Yeah, and then this one came out. It's like, oh wow, wow, what? you can do that. I didn't. I didn't know you could do that. Thanks. Yeah, and and you you mentioned like the Indomitable. I wouldn't be surprised if that one sticks around for a long time. It's, it's really a coastal good. piracy that is easier to tutor mm-hmm. and. It can become a hard deal with creature mm-hmm. and it can come back. Yep. And so like that card is just really, really solid. It's very good. And um, like I've, I've, I've picked up a bunch of those for a ton of decks. Mm-hmm. So and Black Market is such a good reprint. Yeah. So uh, what would you give this one? I give it a B. B? Um, I like it a lot. I think this deck is really solid. Uh, I will say I think in my opinion, it's probably the weakest of the Ixlon uh, mm-hmm. commanders just because all of the other ones really just say, play your creature type, you're going to be great. This yeah. is the only one that's like, play your creature type, but then you one more step, you also got a mill. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so it, it pulls a little bit in two directions. I like that they gave pirates this identity, which they didn't really have before. Um, so that was cool. So for like, a, if I'm building like a kindred pirate deck, like this is probably what I'm doing. So yeah. I liked it. Yep, similar reasons. Uh, I think it's pretty cool. Um, it's the one that probably spoke to me the least. What's great? Of all of them. Oh, B. <laughs> I keep forgetting to say that. Yeah, I, I gave this one a B as well. Yeah. Uh, yeah, like, it's pirates. It's a little bit more interesting than some of the pirates we've seen in the past, but mm-hmm. yeah, it's fine. I gave this one a B. I think it's it's super neat, and it's a very strong pirate deck. The weird thing about it for me was it it's a pirate reanimator deck, and the curve is very low. Yeah. Um, it's sort of like the way they designed it is you sort of want to like reanimate two drops with evasion. Mm-hmm. So it it's like. Y- making your your two mana one one flyer a four four where if i built it i think i would really want to reanimate like eight drops are there big pirates how big do pirates get uh like just try and find the most expensive yeah. pirates i can reanimate sure um there's not a ton just there's, there's no. not a ton it tends to be sort yeah. of like a low curve uh so that felt sort of strange to me mm-hmm. that it like it gave you all these little creatures to reanimate. But um, overall, it's a very strong deck. Obviously, the reprint value is great. If you can pick up any of these decks, you should do it. Um, so I gave it a yeah. B, which means overall, it's a B. Oh, pretty good out of the box. Yeah, I, I like agree. it. Liked it. Up next, Vampires. Let's go, Vampires. The Blood Rights deck. White, black, Vampire deck. The bang for your buck value was $4. Four. Wow. What? So many dollars. What? Uh, more dollars than I have. <laughs> $4 of reprint value for every $1 spent. Again, this is at pre-order price. Your average price per reprint was $2.35. So good, strong quality there. The face commander was Clavileno, first of the blessed. Hashtag blessed. Uh, it's a three mana, two, two vampire cleric. Whenever you attack, target attacking vampire that isn't a demon becomes a demon in addition to its other types. It gains when this creature dies, draw a card and create a tapped four, three white and black vampire demon creature token with flying. Uh, the most valuable reprint was the best of the year with yeah. exquisite blood at $35, narrowly beating the chain veil. Yeah, how exquisite. Very good. The most played new card currently is Charismatic Conqueror, two mana vampire soldier that whenever an artifact or creature enters the battlefield untapped and under its opponent's control, they may tap it. If they don't, you make a vampire. I hate this card. It's, it's so good. Busted. It's so good. If there's three of them in play, it just goes infinite. There's three of them? Yeah. Like, if you clone it or something, or, like, somebody else plays them. Well, somebody just has it come in tapped, right? Yeah, but it says yeah. if it doesn't. Oh, well, it, because see. there's two. Because there's oh, two I in see, play. I see, I see. So, I see. then one person's like, oh, I'll have it enter tapped. And then you're like, you want to have it enter tapped? It's like, oh, well, nope. I already tapped it. Aha. Uh-huh. Yeah, so it's completely. It you may tap that It is permanent. a bit of a rules nightmare. Interesting. And I didn't not interesting. That. Bad design. No. <laughs> Bad design. <laughs> I like it. I like it a lot. <laughs> anyway. I love it. Damon, what is your rank? <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, I give this one an A. Um, mm-hmm. It is really good. I love this deck out of the box. Uh, the only reason it's not an S is it it didn't have enough of the early drops, the one and two drops to really like consistently be like 
creature Cavaleño attack that turn. Mm -hmm. Um, So it needed a little bit of a power boost, Mm -hmm. in my opinion. But outside of that, it was really solid. The uh, reprint value is there. Mm -hmm. It's uh, a really unique and powerful effect where vampire, legendary vampires struggle with the Edgar problem. Yeah. And where Edgar is just like the best thing to be doing. And don't get me wrong, Clavileno is great in the Edgar deck, but this gave it a little bit of a different direction where you're still doing the aggro thing, but instead of being the hyper aggression that Edgar is, you traded that off for a better late game, mm-hmm. which I thought was really cool and being able to play more sack outlets and stuff like that yeah. that Edgar doesn't necessarily care about. Mm-hmm. So for me, this one was a solid A. I really like the deck. I love it out of the box and mm-hmm. I love vampires. So nice. there you go. Murph? Uh, I gave this one a B. Uh, it's pretty cool. Uh, the theme itself also doesn't really speak to me as much, but I think this is built a little bit better than the Pirates deck. Like, it's just by nature of it being a probably better supported archetype. I think yeah. it's just more focused I agree. than Pirates. Uh, but yeah, it's put together pretty well. Blast to play. Some good reprints like the Exquisite Blood. Mm-hmm. And it had a Bloodgast with new art, which yeah. is sick. Yeah. So uh, This is just a great deck to play. Uh play out of the box i i think vampires again are a really grabby creature type people really really love them and uh if you're into vampires you're into this deck i gave it an a overall which means that we are going to give it an a from the command zone we're moving on to the merfolk explore deck merfolk the merfolk, hey, the merfolk hey, de- hey. upgraded this one it's hackball of the surging soul uh this is a blue green merfolk deck slash explore the bang for your buck here was three dollars and 82 cents these are all incredible the average price per reprint was two dollars and 25 cents again above average hawkball introduced sort of a new merfolk thing um He's a 3-3 merfolk scout that it says at the beginning of combat on your turn, each merfolk creature you control explores. Then, whenever Hawkball of the Surging Soul attacks, you may put a land card from your hand onto the battlefield. If you don't, draw a card. (laughs) Uh, The most valuable reprint in the deck was Branching Evolution at $21. The most played new card of the deck was Ripples of Potential uh, for now. This card's sweet. It says uh, one in a blue for an instant. Proliferate. If you choose any number of permanents you control that had a counter put on them uh, this way, those permanents phase out. Very, very good. So good. Fantastic in proliferate decks uh, and like plus one plus counter decks. Great in planeswalker decks. The no. fact that you can choose, pick and choose what you phase out and still get the proliferate no matter what. Really very cool. powerful. Yeah. Yeah. This card's sweet. This deck is awesome. It, it had sort of like some counter stuff going on, but also was it was mostly just a merfolk type old deck. Yeah, it's a yeah. merfolk deck. Uh, what was your rank, Damon? Uh, I give this one an S. Uh, this deck just felt so good, so cohesive. I love the explore mechanic. It meant that as you're playing the game, you're just going to have more cards in hand. Your your creatures are going to get pumped, which helps you start closing out the game. Uh, you're always you always feel like you're powerful, like you're doing something, and uh, it, it just it's so much fun out of the box. So uh, for me, it's a solid S. I really didn't have very many, if any, complaints about it. Um, how about you, Murph? What did you think? Yeah, uh, I think it was very telling when we were doing the upgrade for this. I was struggling to find the cuts. Yes. Yeah. Like I, I read some of the YouTube comments that were like, well, "Why did you cut this card?" Because I had to take because 10 had cards to. out. Look at all the other ones. <laughs> yeah, all the other cards are good. Like, there's only, like, I don't know, like, four or five cards that I would say, like, eh, they're kind of duds. But overall, it's so cohesive. Mm-hmm. The reprints are great. So the new cards are great. Hawkball is a very, very powerful card. Yep. Uh, overall, like, I, this is easily one that I could grab, hand to somebody, and be like, here, play this. It's merfolk. You like water. You like exploring, looking at lands, getting some lands. You're going to have a grand old time. Yep. Uh, I was a little lower on this one. I gave it an A. Um, it, mostly because Hawkball is so complicated. It, it is. It's it like is. if you have four merfolk, you have to, you're like, this, no, this, no. Dude, editing, this one. Editing the Game Nights episode top. of Prof just like doing things, I'm like, every time we got to Prof's turn, I was like, oh no. Oh, it's happening. <laughs> oh, no. It's happening. Oh no. <laughs> and then he has an attack trigger on yeah. top of that. Yep. And the deck had all of these merfolk and like we said it had so many of the cards that you wanted to see in in the deck already which is great but it also had some like branching evolutions is a little weird if i was building it on my own i don't think i would put the plus one plus one synergy in there yeah I wouldn't. you're kind of doing that already and yeah. like simic doesn't really need that support but i think it's a great um, include for the reprint it's a great <laughs> good reprint. we're happy to yeah. see it and yeah. the art is incredible um so i loved this deck i thought it was really well constructed it's perfect to hand somebody off uh Hand, hand somebody who is new or is getting into magic. But again, it does force them into a lot of decision making, yep. which is tough. 
Also, I gave this an S. I keep forgetting to say. You think you said an S? Did I? No, I don't know. I'm just going crazy. (laughs) It's an S. S S. because of Murph's S that he just mentioned. S for Murph's folk. All right. (laughs) We have one more precon to talk about. We've done it, and it is the Velociraptor deck. (laughs) (laughs) The silliest named one, maybe after virtue and valor, which means nothing. Um, (laughs) It's Velociraptor. This is a white, red, green dinosaurs deck. The bang for your buck here is the best of the year at $4.19 of reprint value for every $1 you spend. The average price per reprint was $2.39. Like uh, almost what, like thirty cents higher than the average. Yeah. Um. The face commander was Pantlaza, Sun Favored. This is a five mana dinosaur. It's a four four. When it or another dinosaur enters the battlefield under your control, you may discover X, where X is that creature's toughness. Do it only once each turn. It's okay. Yeah, I'm so glad it doesn't happen more yep. than once. Yeah, if turn. it did, it'd be absurd. Oh my god, it's already so powerful. Uh, the most valuable reprint of the deck was a great reprint. It's a Chroma's Will at twenty five dollars. I was so excited to see this. It's a great win con. I'm for glad they put that as a reprint. Yeah. I love that. I kind of wish that it had dinosaurs on it, but I know it's a Chromas thing. So you kind of have a to put dinosaur. a on it. But it's weird just having all these cats a Chroma in here. riding a dinosaur. There Ooh, you go. There it is. Ooh, that's fun. You can take the one for free, Wizards. The most played new card currently is Wrathful Raptors. This is whenever a dinosaur you control is dealt damage, it deals that much damage to any target that isn't a dinosaur. <laughs> it's a stuffy doll dinosaur. Yeah. yeah. Um, I wish they did a little stuffed animal. That would be fun. <laughs> But it's better than that. It's really good. Okay. I mean, this deck rules. Yeah, it's so it's powerful. It's also, um, it is also, the price has gone up. It's been harder to find. This yeah. is the yeah. most expensive to pick up. It is the most popular um, of them. I think by, by a lot. Yeah. By a lot. Yeah. People yeah. just like dinosaurs. People like big stumpy creatures yep. and yep. that's never going to change. And hopefully. that was and that was even true uh, before the decks got spoiled. Yep. It was already the most popular. People already were picking it up. It was already a little bit harder to find. Mm. Uh, people just really like dinosaurs and dinosaurs yep. really only get an Ixalan. So. What'd you grade it? I graded this one in S. Uh, it's very powerful powerful straight out of the box it's really really fun getting that pant lava trigger or as uh or as jordan says pant lava pants lava pants lava yeah, yeah. <laughs> um pants. it's really re- it feels really really good and the fact that people have taken this this commander and this pre-caught and just been like what if i just blink my commander over and over again i could just make this a naya blink deck shows the strength Sweet. of the ability <laughs> and the, the sort of the strength of of the deck as it's constructed so uh for me it's a solid s i love it it's, a, it's so much fun and it's a deck you could definitely give to a new player be like dinosaurs are cool you know dinosaurs are cool you're gonna have a blast with this deck you're gonna mm-hmm. impact the game you you could you have a good shot of winning because it's great mm-hmm. um so s yeah very cool murph yeah um, that, that's a little bit interesting because I, I, I gave this an A. Uh, I didn't love the discoverability from this commander. Uh, what are they doing? Yeah. No good. more. No more. Yeah. Cascades. Cascades. They, they didn't fix any of the problems of Cascade. They're like, it's a fixed Cascade because you can put this into your hand. No. That's not. That's not. It was too good. Make it yeah. less. Yeah. <laughs> Fair. Fair. Yeah. And the initial one that you get when it enters, it's always going to be something small. So you're like, yeah, I'm going to get big dinosaurs. And then you don't because mm-hmm. Pantlaza's toughness is not very high. Yep. So there's always one that you're just like, eh, I, I guess I get it for value. But that's that's not the big fun thing that you're looking for. Yeah. Uh, but I, uh, again, I can't really complain too much about it. So overall, A. Yep. Uh, I gave this one an S. I It's just people were so, so good excited deck. about it. And it, it's the kind yeah. of commander that I was like, ooh. Uh, I'm not a big dinosaurs person. I don't build a ton of typal decks overall. Um, but this this commander and the backup commander, Waita. Um, oh, doing the fight thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, is gives you a, a fight commander are both really neat and I think are both going to be pretty popular. Yeah. So overall, I think we're going to see a lot of this, even if it's in the 99 of a Gishath deck. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but I gave it an S overall, which means that we are going to rate it an S. Yep. Nice. All right. That is all the pre-cons. We did it. There's 25. Oh, my gosh. Oh, everyone stuck okay? with us to the end. You're, Thank you. You're, you're the, the best. best. Uh, uh, we'll give you another you rock. <laughs> yeah. Before we go, uh, best set of pre-cons for the year for you. Uh, for me, it's the fairy deck. I think. I mean, oh, best, best oh, set. The set. In yeah. that case, I'm gonna give it to Woe. Yeah. Um, str- because both of those decks just felt really solid. I really, really like them. Again, the fairy deck for me is, if I had to pick one, the best deck mm. in, of the year for, in my opinion. And uh, like, yes, Ixalan is definitely up there, and I, I definitely would be the other choice for me. Yeah. But 
I just really, really love the flavor and the feel of those decks in particular, because like the issue with the, um, the Ixalan decks for me, if you're a player who doesn't really care about like the Kindred theme, mm. then it's hard for, for me to sell it to you. Cause like, so if you're the like, guy who's like, well, this one has a fairies theme. I think that's the best because it has fairies. No, but here's the thing. <laughs> because it gives you that Alayla option, you don't have to build mm. it as a fairy deck. Mm -hmm. Like, you can just build it as a flash deck or yeah. as a control deck or as any number. You could even do, like, a blink thing, maybe. There's a ton of options that you have there. Um, the Virtue and Valor, again, doing the enchantment things, but going in a little bit of a different direction, a more aggressive feel, yeah. where you can pick up those decks if you don't like Kindred decks. And I'm a huge, huge fan of that mm -hmm. type of, art, of strategy. I have a ton of creature focused decks mm -hmm. um, but I liked the flexibility that the woe decks give you that the Ixalan decks do not necessarily offer mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so for me I would give it to woe for that reason yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I, th I think I just overall ranked the wilds of Eldraine a little bit higher than Lost Caverns mm -hmm. but I think I would have to say Lost Caverns just for me because there's four of them versus two of them Yeah, and sure. so then that gives you more flexibility as far as like what you want and what you're looking for in a deck mm -hmm. and I think it's just a lot harder to make all four decks that are all really good like even yeah. the pirate deck which is my least favorite of them is still a it's b still in my book mm -hmm. yeah and so as a result i think that's the one that i want like lord of the rings like well, that had some bangers in it but also it had the elves deck so yeah. that was kind of whatever yeah and so that's that's a common theme that you find with commander decks there's always one or two that just aren't that great uh but with lost caverns of exelon there are absolutely no duds and so as a yeah. result best of the year for me True. Yep, I think it's hard to argue with Lost Caverns of Ix Ixalan. Uh, also, that, reprints. Yeah, yeah the yeah. reprints so good. That said, uh, I've got to go with. I have to say, Lord of the Rings, and Ooh, I, yeah. I have to, I have to. It. They were the most for me. They were the most special decks yeah. of the year. That's if fair. we're talking about like can't miss products, if we're talking about like what I would say everybody had to buy. Yeah. It felt like everybody had to get a Lord of the Rings deck. And yeah. where these are like, I'm not I'm not into dinosaurs, I'm gonna skip the dinosaur deck. Or like, mm -hmm. I really like vampires, I'll pick up the vampire one. Um I, I it felt like Lord of the Rings, every single deck had something really special and really new to offer in a world that felt really fun and silly and sure. like recognizable. Yeah. Um so I have to go with the Lord of the Rings deck, even though we rated them a little lower in terms of deck construction. Um I think they were just too too special yeah. for me to uh, rank them any lower. Yeah, and I think it's totally respectable and fair to, if you were to tell somebody, if you could only buy one thing this whole year, buy the Lord of the Rings things, yeah. I think that is a great and excellent choice and has a huge appeal outside of just Magic players. And it's a great way to pull people in and get them to play, and those texts were really well constructed. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, worst set of pre-guns for the year uh for me it's got to be the doctor who ones yeah. um they're just really rough to play out of the box again i love the doctor who flavor mm -hmm. i think that is really cool and the individual cards are pretty solid but i it's hard for me to tell new players hey go pick these up they are at a little bit more of a premium and they're they're kind of rough out of the box you're gonna have to upgrade them as well mm. um close second to that being commander masters so okay. <laughs> yeah 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 murph uh yeah, I, I would probably say Commander Masters, just because even with Doctor Who, you can play Magic, but with some things like the Sliver deck, you just You're cannot not playing magic. play Magic. Yeah, and there's too many feel bads I find in that deck. Of well, I can't play this. I can't play that. Uh, like Anixia is really the only one that feels like a reasonably cohesive deck to me because mm -hmm. Shulak has all the six drops, and you're sitting there with all these uh, six drops that you can't really play because your commander wants you to play seven or more. Uh, so I think that that's probably the biggest disappointment. Even if the price wasn't what it is, like even if they were like. 50 60 dollars or something like that i still would not like those decks very much mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so overall i think those are the biggest disappointment to me uh, and doctor who's probably a little bit of a close second but there's enough fun memorable individual cards yeah. for me that that ranks above the commander masters at least for me that makes sense yeah i agree i it's a really tough call between the two of them because again there's so much joy and love put into the doctor who cards yeah, there, yeah. there's so much like recognizable neat stuff like the cool factor is high you can very, tell very that high. the people that made it like had passion for it right. and i think that bleeds through quite a bit right that's true um I, that being said, I think if you threw all of the Doctor Who cards into a giant bucket and shook them all around and drew 100 cards, they would play just as well. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Ouch. But also not true. wrong. She's not wrong. <laughs> just, just like, <laughs> I'll play this Doctor and this Companion. All right. Yep. Um, it, it, 
it was just I think that one was my biggest disappointment of the year yeah. because there it's such a good window for um new fans, like fans of Doctor Who to yeah. enter magic. Yeah. And they were just had so much cool stuff going on that you just really wanted them to be fun to play. Yeah. And they they were very frustrating for me. So I really struggled with the Doctor Who ones. But that being said, I think if we're talking worst products of the year, uh, the Commander Masters are higher on the list. Let's go. Um, I, I very much agree with that. I, I think they really uh, blew it with Commander Masters overall. Yeah. I, I think it was, it, it just felt like a cash grab. Like yeah. it, it felt like the, the decks didn't work that well yeah. and it felt like everything was priced too high and i've never had a worse time opening package like cards yeah where where you're just like all right i like this isn't this this isn't what i paid for yeah. and um the, the only reason i have the jula doc deck is because i got it at an event at one yeah. of the magic cons because mm -hmm. i'm like oh i, I want to play yeah. one of yeah. these sealed events and i had a miserable time and went home and the jula doc deck has been sitting on my desk ever since yeah, yeah and I, I, I was given the sliver deck randomly and it, oh, it went so into sorry. its box and it never came out yeah i'm yeah. so sorry uh, <laughs> and the only reason i picked them up is because I, I was able to find them cheaper yeah. in a different place because i would not have paid full nope, price for them not. Mm. and it was really unfortunate too because that was right after lord of the rings where yeah. we had a huge influx yeah. of new players and so it's like we have all these new players we finally grabbed them from other places mm. they're really excited to play magic because they just got all these really cool commander decks and all these really cool cards and you immediately followed it up with commander masters with premium price like, set backed well, up against a premium price set yeah. and i'm like i, I can't do that if i'm gonna spend money on something it's gonna be lord of the rings it's gonna i'm be lord of the sorry rings. i'll yeah. buy another collect i will like buy more <laughs> i'll buy all the precons yeah. again for lord of the rings before yeah. i by the commander it, it's so rough that yeah. that's how they followed it up like yeah. oh, uh a, interesting year uh, generally i think a very good year for precons yeah, i think I most of the precons were were pretty fun out of the box we were we were very low on i almost said march the machine honestly i yeah. think march the machine should have had two decks and they should have been great and then we move on I, th I think they were like oh well we can pull from literally anywhere in magic's history because yeah. it's like all of these points in history and all these planes like all coming together to mm. fight yeah. so we should make lots of things yeah. in order to celebrate that yeah but they were just mostly duds yeah and they yeah. also definitely want but there's some like glimmers of hope there right like the yeah. knights one is awesome is i really liked the convoke deck um the, there was like some creativity in in there that we hadn't seen before and yeah. some very popular commanders that came that's out why i had ranking above yeah. commander Masters um, for sure yeah. right uh so i i i think generally like uh Ixalan was incredible. Lord so of the good. Rings was awesome. Yep. Well, All Will Be One was quite good. Yep. It, generally, there's there's a lot of positivity. Trend. And yeah. if we get another round of precons like like, can you imagine if Ixalan precons had come out right after Lord of the Rings? It would have been amazing. You would have been yeah. like like trumpets would have set. Like, yeah. Yeah. In instead, it just sort of had been this such a good wah, 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 in the middle wah. of the year. Yeah. All right. This has been a long episode to the <laughs> listeners. <laughs> What was your favorite pre-con this year? Did we nail it? Did we miss it? Which one didn't hit the mark for you? Uh, did we overrate or underrate any of your uh, any of the decks for you? What could Wizards do to improve pre-cons in 2024? Or did we not mention something that you think they nailed in 2023? Uh, lots to talk about. Lots of pre-cons this year. Yep. Hope you got some cool pre-cons that, uh, that, you know, you rated an A or an S. <laughs> Uh, if you want to pick up any of the cards that we talked about to today, any of the sealed pre-cons, uh, a lot of them are still online at cardkingdom.com slash command. Uh, there's a ton of pre-cons that came out this year, a lot of new cards designed specifically for you commander players. And we're really picky about the cards that we get. I like to have the cards in exactly the printing that I want, in exactly the condition that I want. And I go to Card Kingdom because I trust that they have a huge inventory of cards and I can get a bunch of cards at once from one place when i'm building a deck and i add 30 cards to a cart and i hit ship and it shows up on my doorstep and i get to start building right away i hate waiting for one more envelope to show up especially in if it's the your mail. commander yeah, yeah. Like, come on <laughs> i have a problem where the mail guy just shoves it into my mailbox oh and no like, <laughs> like please and you're stop. like yeah uh, that's why i i like to shop at card kingdom these days because they package it professionally they are made of paper so they're uh make sure that they arrive safe on your doorstep and you can do so while supporting the show at cardkingdom.com slash command yeah and if you use ultra pro products you can even get all of the matching art and stuff on your sleeves on your play mats to whatever one of your pre-cons that you like you like pont laza mm -hmm. a lot you can get 
get Pont Laza sleeves, Pont Laza uh, play mats. Um, you can get some dice that are even colored like Pont Laza, yeah. probably mm. because there's all sorts of stuff at ultrapro.com slash command. And they just have tons of inventory. Even if you're not looking for anything in particular, sign up for their newsletter. They'll have deals on there all the time. There's always something where I'm like, hey, that's neat. I didn't know I needed that. I'll take that. Thank you very much. So again, ultrapro.com slash command. Okay, we're going to move to the cleanup step and say thank you to our amazing team here at the Command Zone who edited this monster. <laughs> <laughs> thank you to Eric Lem, Megan Yip, Garab Galati, Jordan Pridgen, Jamie Block, Arthur Meadowcroft, Manson Lung, Jake Boss, Sam Waldo, Evan Limberger, Katie Cole, Mitch Trafford, Josh Lee Kwai, Jimmy Wong, and of course, special thank you to Damon Lance and Josh Murphy for taking the time to record this episode. Yeah, always well, a pleasure I being edited in this one. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That, this is all me. I got this. <laughs> what if yeah. we, we made Josh do it? Like, yeah. Josh, yeah. you get you to edit a podcast. <laughs> Finally, it's been years. You got to do it. You <laughs> got this josh I have thank you for here. watching we hope you enjoyed all the precons this year and hope to see some cool new ones in 2024 happy new year everybody bye bye thank you for your attention for further inquiries, send an email to commandcast at rocketjump.com or ask us on Twitter at JF Wong and at Josh Lee Kwai. See you later, alligator. Greetings, humans. <laughs>